please, I think we can start, right? So, um, except, of, except in the first talk, all talks will be of 20 minutes, 15 minutes plus five minutes for questions and answers. And so, good. So, Sam, when you like to start, please do it. Okay. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak here. I wanted to give a general overview of these amazing observations from Event Horizon Telescope Collaboration, both my opinion on how you should view the data and its interpretation, and my opinion on how you should make theoretical inference about the nature of the source. And I want to start by sort of reminding you that that beautiful picture is, you know, one of many pictures you could make from the data. The data themselves live in Fourier space. There are a list of numbers that were arrived at after very hard work by the collaboration, and you can download in a second online, and here they are. Presumably, most people here know the basics of interferometry, but here's a quick review. You take two radio dishes, and you point them at the same source, and you take the complex electric field measured in one, and you multiply it by the complex electric field measured by the other, and then you average over time. And by a marvelous, fairly simple derivation, under very mild assumptions about the source, this thing, the radio visibility, that's the jargon for this multiply and average, is actually the Fourier transform of the sky. Uh, so, you know, you can say an interferometer takes the Fourier transform of the sky, and that's basically true. There really aren't um, too many caveats. In principle, now in practice, um, there's some issues, especially with very long baseline interferometry. And I wanted to show this equation here just because if I had seen this much earlier in my sort of journey towards learning about interferometers, I would have understood why it's so hard. Uh, and basically the problem is you can't really calibrate your telescopes in VLBI. And so each little dish has a complex you know, residual gain, what's left over after your best efforts to calibrate. And so the actual Fourier transform of the sky, which here I'm calling the true visibility, is related to what you actually measure by some fairly complicated stuff. The noise in the interferometer is the least of your worries. So I'm not going to get into detail about that, but I wanted to front load it as a kind of, this is why we can't draw as many conclusions as maybe we would like in this very exciting first measurement. So each pair of telescopes in the array gives you a pixel in Fourier space, if you like. I feel like people should call these pixels. That would be a nice name. Oh, my mouse disappeared. OK. And so uh, here are the EHT telescopes that were used in the 2017 observations. And here they are projected onto the line of sight. And you can see that it's some pretty sparse coverage of the plane, but uh, you know, pretty darn good for a, for a first attempt at, at imaging a black hole. So the natural question, and I really want to start this talk with sort of the list of data, which are the Fourier space pixels, uh, is, you know, what do you do with them? <laughs> and, you know, at the most basic level, sort of the answer is always you fit a model, uh, you know, which is what EHT did. Of course, they had many different models. They tried a lot of different things. Uh, you're going to run into the issue of these residual gains. I'm going to totally gloss over that here. Uh, but you have choices once you figure out how you're going to handle the gains of sort of where you do your model. So I think the kind of fundamentally most best way of doing this would be to do your modeling, you know, in the source, you know, just sort of make a first principles model here of uh, M87, you know, the stuff near it, the plasma, and then you ray trace that, you follow the photons that are emitted to your detector, get an image, you Fourier transform that, you get your visibility and you compare that to the data. And then you learn something about the source. That's challenging in part because the source models aren't so good. 
And so an alternative approach, which I'm going to focus on today, is you do your modeling in the image plane. You just sort of parameterize some shapes the image could take, or really the classic clean algorithm. Those of you from radio astronomy, I consider a version of this. You're modeling it by point sources. You're doing a lot of steps to compare to data, but you're not trying to model the source directly. And once you have that, what you need to go back to understanding the source is some set of heuristics that sort of let you stare at a noisy image and say, oh yeah, I think that's uh, this kind of source and so on. So let me go into a little more detail about these two paths. So the first one where you would try to model the source and constrain that model. Well, this last step on the right, the Fourier transform, that's easy. We've got great algorithms for that. Even ray tracing, following photons in the Kerr metric these days is really routine. I mean, the codes are really good and they're semi-analytic approaches in part that I've worked on. Um, it's not hard. The trouble with this approach is, you know, getting a model of the source. That's hard. I mean, this is a collisionless plasma. If you wanna really believe everything, you ought to be doing pick simulations, but you've got a big magnetosphere. I mean, it's. It's very much beyond the computational state of the art. Now we're gonna have talks on this. There's been a ton of progress in PIC simulations in pulsar and black hole magnetospheres in the last few years. It's, it's incredibly exciting, but we're pretty far from getting you know, one model that really could be called first principles and reliable. And of course, for this pipeline, you need many models, right? To compare to the data. Uh, so I think this approach is, is less promising. And I'm gonna be focusing on the second approach where you do your modeling in the image domain. And so now we have this Fourier transform, which is still very fast. Now choosing the model you wanna use, this is where it gets a little dicey. You know, it's, there's no free lunch, right? You, you have to sort of, you know, you wouldn't get very far if you just said, my model is every pixel can have some brightness and let's fit that. Um, on the other hand, if you say my model is it's a ring, you've built in the answer, right? So there, you know, here's where people can argue over what's reasonable. And, and I think you really want different groups trying different things uh, to be fully confident. But if you've done that and you've inferred sort of the general characteristics of the image, then the last step is to use some heuristics to infer what might be going on in the source. And that's a place where I've been involved over the last couple of years. And I'm gonna tell you some about that today. So this is my plan. And if questions have occurred to you already, now would be a good time to raise your hand. My plan is, first of all, I'm gonna review what EHT did and preview some results my student is gonna talk about in the next talk in terms of inferring image properties from the data. So that's the right part of this uh, diagram up here. And then I'm going to spend a little more time saying, OK, supposing you know what the image looks like, what can you infer about the source? And then finally, I'll come back to the title of the talk, and I'll tell you at least my take on, on what we've learned from this uh, amazing data set. OK. So now we want to think about how we might take that list of numbers in that public data file. Uh, Fourier space pixels subject to this error budget and uh, get an image. So I think what EHT did was very sensible and quite good. They just tried a whole bunch of methods. They have basically five of them. There's acronyms up there. Doesn't matter what they mean. The point is there's a lot of them and each one has freedom within it in terms of parameters you choose within the model. There's two general classes, uh, you know, for the experts, there's models where you parameterize shapes in the image domain and get kind of posterior ranges on the parameters describing those shapes, or there's the more classic imaging algorithms. I'm grouping these all together as one sort of attempt of getting a sense of the sky appearance from the data. And here's what they found. So of course, each method was run many times with many different parameters. There's some bias in choosing pictures to show you. I just chose the ones in the EHT paper for April 6th. So you see that all the different five images gave annuluses of about the same size. That's pretty cool. That's a robust feature, this 40 micro arc second ring that we've all heard about. But notice the width of the ring changes dramatically and, and I've sorted them by width here. 
Um, so some of the geometric models give amazingly thin rings. And, and the clean algorithm, which blurs everything to a canonical resolution anyway, can only give a thick ring, and, and it does. Uh, so the, the ring width is really quite uncertain. And that motivated me to get into looking at the data. And my, my student will tell you what we've found in the next talk. Um, but for now, I just want to point out that certain features are robust and certain aren't. And so instead of visualizing a single poster child image, I find it more profitable to have a picture kind of like this in mind, a kind of skeleton of the image, which sort of says, well, we know there's a ring of about 40 micro arc seconds in diameter, but we're not so sure how wide it is. We think it's brighter in the south, but could be up here, could be over there, you know, something like that. And there might be some other features. So this is my summary of, you know, what the data tell us uh, according to EHT and backed up by some of the analysis we've done about the sky appearance. Any questions before I move on to the second part of talking about heuristics? Okay. It seems there are no questions. So the next part is supposing we've learned about our image. Now, how do we figure out what's going on at the source? So I think there's five useful heuristics that I found useful uh, in understanding this in my personal journey to figure out what the heck that image meant. And um, I've got them listed here along with the references that, that first worked them out. But of course, there are many other references on, on all of these. And I'll have a slide on, on references at the end. Um, there's, and I'm going to go through them roughly in order. There's sort of the dumbest possible thing, which <laughs> Alex and I, Alex Uchaska and I kind of stumbled on. Uh, certain aspects are very simple. And then there's a the notion of a photon ring. That's a relativistic effect. And these shadows you may have heard of. If I have time, I'm going to go through them. I, they're not really relevant. Um, there's no justification for calling the picture the black hole shadow. Uh, so I don't want to focus on an idea that isn't useful, but it's, well, it's useful as kind of framing the overall discussion. So I will get to that later in the talk, but I'll focus on the first three. So let's take a step back and remember, you know, how a camera works. So we can really go through this from the beginning. Uh, of course, a camera measures an intensity. It's a power per unit area and per unit solid angle. Those of us used to thinking about flux lines can get confused because of that per solid angle it makes it very different from a magnetic field line, for example. And the intensity is conserved on a ray. So when you think about the image, you know, it, you, it can sort of live anywhere along the, you know, it's really just intensity as a function of angle from the observer. And in this game, everybody thinks of the image as living at infinity and being at the same size as the source. That's a useful convention. The error in doing that is very small as the observer gets very far away. You know, these black lines become parallel to these blue lines. So when I talk about image, it's always going to be impact parameter image. Okay, you just sort of look at photons and see where they arrive on a giant screen the same size as the black hole at infinity. And then that's proportional to the intensity on your actual image. So let's start thinking about what gravity does for the image. Uh, well, gravity bends the light a little bit. And so uh, if you imagine the light going backwards from the observer to the source, it's going to bend inwards. And shooting the light backwards is much more convenient because now you're only talking about the photons you care about, right? This teapot emits in all directions. If we started tracking forward in time, we'd have to carefully choose the photons that end up at the detector, which we don't know until we've solved for the photons. So everybody in the game goes backwards from the detector. So you imagine sort of, it's almost like a scattering problem. You're shooting both a big beam of photons in by impact parameter, and they're going to curve a bit. And wherever they hit the source, you say, aha, this ray had intensity equal to that of the source. And so at the origin of that ray, you assign that intensity and you fill out a picture of the teapot. 
And you can see just from the picture on the screen that because gravity is bending the light towards the gravitating source, the gravitating teapot just looks a little bigger. Right? If there weren't gravity, this one would have just gone straight. But because of the bending, it arrived a little bigger. So I'm going to be using impact parameter space coordinates, um, alpha and beta. And then B is the radius of the impact, so the actual impact parameter. And so you'd expect that if this thing had a size r, you just see something slightly bigger in impact parameter. And actually, this works ridiculously well, even for a black hole. So get ready. I'm now going to show you the actual version of this plot for a disk around a Kerr black hole arbitrarily close it. OK, here it is. All right, so first of all, um, notice the two lines are on top of each other. Spin makes absolutely no difference. And in fact, spin has almost no effect on lensing. If anyone says they've measured spin from a measurement like this, they, what they've done is made some astrophysical assumptions that make the emission profile depend on spin. It's not coming from lensing. OK, uh, so what is this showing us? This is showing us that if uh, a photon leaves at, uh, let's say, r equals 4, it arrives at, oh, it looks like about b equals 5. Now, if it leaves at r equals 6, it arrives at, oh, it looks like about 7. And in fact, this is very <laughs> well approximated by just adding 1. OK, uh, so we sort of noticed this numerically. Actually, I left out a reference. Uh, Gates et al. Uh, derived it analytically in the, in the large um, d limit, but it, it works very well. So if you don't want to do any ray tracing at all, you just think you have a model that gives a roughly equatorial emission profile, and you're roughly viewing it from above. You don't do any ray tracing. You just add 1. Okay, It just gets slightly bigger, just like this t -pop. All right. And actually, the GRMHD models are basically equatorial. So you can use this to get pretty much everything at EHT resolution. It's, it's really, really simple, surprisingly so. So that's my first heuristic for helping us infer properties of the source from properties of the image. Just add one. Now, to get some more detail, uh, we'll have to deal with relativistic effects, but I like to emphasize it's not a mysterious, complicated thing that you need a big computer and a fancy general relativity expert to deal with. You can understand in very simple terms, simple terms, all of the relativistic effects. These are the two that matter. Okay, the first is redshift. So this is uh, sort of a mix of special relativity and general relativity. Of course, Doppler boosts are very important. This matter is going to be moving comparably to the speed of light in some cases, and then the black hole extinguishes light near it as well, not just at the horizon. There's this gentle extinguishing. That's the gravitational redshift. And in the intensity framework, this shows up just in the fact that if you're dealing with relativity, it, the intensity is not conserved anymore. It's the in specific intensity over the wavelength cubed. I did a power to the four here to do bolometric. It's not important. Um, the point is you do have to worry about redshifts. And so the ratio G of the of the two redshifts emitted and observed is going to make the light brighter or darker depending on relative motion and proximity to the gravitating center. That's one important effect. And the other one is, is that light can orbit a black hole. This was understood you know, right away by David Hilbert. Uh, and, it's a, and, and its effects on lensing were worked out by pioneering papers in the 70s, uh, particularly Luminae. Uh, but it's also something that you can understand in simple terms. You don't really need to calculate to get the gist of it. Uh, you just imagine, remember, we're doing backward ray tracing. And so we are sending in a group of photons from the right and seeing where they intersect the source. Um, so a photon sent in at a large impact parameter just deflects. A photon sent in at a small impact parameter falls in. There's a critical impact parameter where the photon just sort of orbits forever. That'll be at 3m for a Schwarzschild black hole, and it's a little more complicated for a Kerr black hole. Not thematically, but physically, it's, it's quite similar. OK, and so there's a critical curve, and I should have referenced Pardeen in his seminal paper for uh, first discussing this critical curve in generality, inside of which the photons will fall in and outside of which the photons will deflect. 
so if we flip this on, on, our, on its head and we imagine a source emitting, what that means is you see that source many times in principle, right? So if you had a source, where's my disappearing mouse? If you had a source here, it could send a photon you know, directly to the observer, or it could send one looping around the black hole and coming to the observer and so on. And so if the matter is completely transparent and you see all those photons from everything, in principle, you see an infinite number of copies of everything in the universe. That's what the black hole does for you. And in practice, the first image is probably not quite relevant at EHT re resolution, but close. And we'll see that we'll see that later. Okay, so this critical curve is the threshold where all the images are going to appear. It's, they're all going to sort of be around this critical curve. All right, now let's draw some pictures using the actual problem. So instead of that cartoon, now what I've done is just plotted some geodesics in Schwarzschild. And I've color coded them to help you understand how much they deflect. Okay, so again, you imagine them coming in from the right. The black ones are the ones that bend 90 degrees or less. And if you're following this plot over here, that 90 degree bend is counted as three quarters of an orbit, right? Because just going straight would be half an orbit. So it's, it's a funny counting, but we need that to be able to handle the ones that don't orbit at all, like in here. These ones bend less than, you know, complete a very small number of orbits before they fall in. They basically fall straight. Now the gold ones are the ones where you're gonna see an effect of some importance in EHT. These are ones that bend between 90 degrees and where's my mouse, uh, and 90 plus 180 degrees, like so. And so for these ones, you could imagine if there's a blob of matter here, say, you might see it twice. You'd see some from direct emission and some from bending around the black hole. And personally, I have yet to encounter a emitting geometry that I cannot understand by literally pulling up this plot and drawing blobs for where the emission is and following lines to the observer and saying, oh yeah, it should look basically like this. And that has always worked for me. So that's the sort of draw pictures heuristic that I'm gonna advance for understanding the relativistic effects. Okay, so for something like M87, best guess is it's some kind of disc. Uh, maybe not this thin, although some of the GRHD models are this thin, actually, in terms of the emission. But in any case, some kind of disk viewed at a roughly face-on angle is the best guess for M87. So what have I done? I've taken my conch plot here, and I've drawn a line for the emitting matter, the disk is. And I'm just going to imagine slapping down an emission profile on that disk. You can get it from GRMHD if you want, or some other model. But from my point of view, if we don't have first principles modeling, we really should be just exploring various emission profiles, not taking too seriously anything that comes out of a particular code. So I've just put some emission profile on here, and here's the you know, fully ray traced radial profile. Okay, but let's understand the features. So let's start at very large impact parameter. So we imagine tracing our ray back in time, it hits the disk. So we're going to see the intensity of the disk. This is the just as one regime. And so at very large intent, uh, uh, impact parameter on the image, we just see whatever the emission profile is, which presumably is falling off. But as we get to smaller impact parameters and we enter this band colored gold, that's where these rays bend. And so let's imagine following a gold ray back in time. So we, it hits the front of the disk. And so we're going to see the front of the disk. But we keep following that ray. Come on, disappearing mouse. We keep following that ray until it hits the back of the disk. And so we're going to actually see the back of the disk and the front of the disk at once. And that's what's going on here. If we had turned off those orbiting pieces and just had the direct image, it would look like this. But instead, we have a whole other copy of the backside of the disk. And this is a case, um, you know, this feature had been seen, although not in cross section like this, but people certainly knew there was this photon ring here. Um, but I think there was a bit of a language confusion as to what causes it. There was a lot of statements of it, it's due to emission near the photon orbit. 
That's wrong. Uh, this is emission from everywhere. It has a contribution from near the photon orbits, but these gold lines are bringing you emission from the whole back of the disk. If it were bright out here at 20 M, there'd be a photon that went like this and came to you at 5 M. So, you, so you're actually seeing the whole back of the disk in this photon ring. It's, it's not just from the strong field region. You can think of it in terms of magnification. It's a demagnified image. It's just the same emission profile here, but squished, right? So it's got a hump. So the pat way of explaining what you'd expect to see in this case is you'd see superposed successively demagnified images of the disk. So this is another good place to stop and see if anyone has any questions. I'll pause for a minute. No questions yet, so okay. go ahead. So this is a toy model. Uh, oh, we have one real quick. Um, yeah, so uh, the question is regarding the subbing structure that you see, uh, that you were supposed to see in observation. So it's been told that the subbing structure is a GR effect per se. So um, is it yeah, visible it is. in the GR MHD, is it visible in the GR MHD simulations also? And is the visibility ascribed to GR or is it an astrophysical effect or is it a mixture of both? Okay, great question. So in reverse order, the answer is yes, it's definitely a GR. Uh, if you could observe this, you would be, that would be the kind of conclusive total proof it has to be a black hole. This is really from the fact that light orbits and you need a black hole to do that. Even a strongly gravitating object wouldn't do that. Um, so yes, this would be really exciting if you could see it. You can't see it yet in the HD, but you do see it in the GRM HD simulation. So that's actually a perfect segue to my next slide, which is, you know, we did this right after the EHT results came out and nobody had ever published a cross section like this. There were some grainy images and papers, uh, but we did not know if this structure was there. Um, so this is, you know, what we put in our paper. We said, this is what it ought to look like. There ought to be this discrete stacked demagnified images type thing. And then actually really a few weeks later, maybe less, uh, I got an email from so I said what we want to getting we want some to echoing from the monitor, thank you. And actually, you know, a couple weeks after we uploaded our paper, something like that, I got an email from uh, people in EHT. This was Gammy's group and his student, now postdoc George Wong, had ray traced the same models in their paper, just at higher resolution and made cross sections and it looked cross sections and it looked identical, uh, you know, to what we had predicted with these simple heuristics and ray tracing toy models. Um, so that's another way of seeing that this is really a universal feature. Okay, you could do the dumbest thing we did. You could do the most complicated thing possible and it's there, it looks like this. So that was very exciting and, and told us we were on the right track in our quest to understand uh, what you can infer about the source from a given image. All right, any other questions on the photon ring stuff? I didn't use that name, but this is called the photon ring, generally this spiky thing, before I move on to shadows. Yes, there is, there is one question in the chat. Um, oh, I can read it, yes. It says, uh, yeah, would the same, same figure, figure come from yeah. exotic compact objects? Um, okay, I should be careful. I did say definitive proof it's a black hole. I, I, I'm sure one can, I haven't studied the exotic compact object space times, but certainly if you have an object which can let light orbit, then if you see the signature of orbiting light, then you can only say it's an object that lets light orbit. I was sort of assuming GR and checking that it was a black hole. Uh, but if these things can exist even within GR using exotic fields or something, then yeah, strictly speaking, you would only know it's something that can allow light to orbit. Uh, I will comment that I've got another line of work on future space-based VLBI where we're trying, where we're claiming you can really measure the exact shape of this ring. Uh, if you give us enough money and technology to launch the right mission or whatever, but that would really be able to conceivably distinguish between an, an actual Kerr black hole and some exotic compact object. Looks like we have another question from Marco. Yes, thank you. Uh, 
um, do you have any, any idea about the possible sources for these toy models? Possible sources? In, in the sense that th th there is a, some kind of matter that generates these toy models, ideas like that. Uh, I don't know too much about that. Um, my sense is, you know, the basic, okay, so the basic physical properties of the system suggest it's a collisionless plasma. Uh, so emission is presumably synchrotron, but what emit, what the profile is, where the emission comes from, how fast it falls off, I really don't know. My gut is things like to form disks. So my guess was always it would be some kind of disk, but you know, there are old discussions about, well, this disk may not have time to radiatively cool. And so it's probably really puffy and that tries to explain the low luminosity. But then the simulations show that even if it's puffy, the emission is equatorial. So I think my answer is I don't know too much about it. I just want to bracket the different toy models. And this is the appearance you expect for a disc. Uh, and the prevailing belief is that it's some kind of disc and this does match you know, what you see in the most complex models. Right, thank you. And that's actually a good segue to the next bit, which is what if it's not a disc? You know, there are, uh, you, you, if, you're, if your game is to bracket possibilities with toy models that give good heuristics and build intuition, you shouldn't just stick to what you think it is, right? And so this is where the uh, shadow comes in. So there's been a lot of discussion in the literature about what a backlit black hole would look like. Actually, those statements are all wrong, uh, surprisingly. Um, the backlit black, black hole, as far as I know, was first worked out by us. It's not hard, but um, you know, we just sort of did it. Uh, and you just do the same thing. You imagine sending uh, you know, here photons in from the observer and you see where they hit the source. And so now if the source is a big screen far behind the black hole, well, anything at sufficiently large impact parameter is gonna hit the source. But once you hit that critical one where you bend 90 degrees, you won't see it anymore. And so you see a big dark area of radius equal to that impact parameter where they, the light rays bend 90 degrees. And you also see a little photon ring in there too. That's from you know, stuff that goes around once and then hits the screen, but you can basically ignore it. Uh, so this, uh, if I were making the words, I guess I would call this the black hole shadow or silhouette, this bigger circle. You see people calling this smaller one at the critical impact parameter for orbiting many times, the black hole shadow. Best guess for why that might be other than historical misunderstandings is um, if you instead illuminate the black hole from all directions, um, then you will get a dark area exactly equal to the critical impact parameter. Because now the question of whether you see any light or not is entirely the question of whether this backward trace photon went in, right? Even if it went around eight times, it's got to hit somewhere on the celestial sphere, right? And so any photon that escapes, you see light from. Any photon that doesn't fall in. And this is the sort of closest way of making the words black hole shadow uh, sensible. Now, the original paper that coined the word shadow, the Falke et al. work, is a very good, very interesting paper. I'm not knocking that at all. I don't like the terminology, uh, but let's go over what they found. So they considered a very specific situation, all right? They considered not a disk, but radial infall, okay? They did, they did Keplerian shells too, but the shadow effect they found was in radial infall, okay? And I don't want to spend too much time drawing pictures and showing this one, but uh, it has an extremely sharp drop right at the critical curve, right at this 5M thing. Okay, it looks more like that sphere lit shadow. And I never understood the reason for that until this paper, um, Narayan Johnson Gammy came out and that explained it. It's Doppler deboosting, it's very simple. Okay, it's just the fact that stuff arriving inside of this critical curve was always counter to the flow or was emitted counter to the flow. And so it's just Doppler boosted to oblivion. That's all it is. If you have radial infall, you'll see this effect, okay? So it's a very interesting effect. You will see a dark area right at this critical curve if your model has radial infall, but it's, it's not generic in any way. And people don't expect this for M87. So just to sort of emphasize that, you know, there's a few kinds of shadows people have talked about. 
and you know they're not there. I mean, maybe I don't know. Maybe M eighty seven is radial in pulling. I, after all, I don't know. But most people think not. And you know, even the EHT's own models don't show anything like this shadow effect. They they show like you know what what we found in the toy models and what multiple papers now, especially this latest one, which is very good, have shown you know is present in in GRMHD. So GRMHD is in the disc regime. All right, I'm wrapping up now. I just wanted to flash up a references slide. Um, these are just my selective list of favorite papers to learn about the things I've talked about today. So if you're interested, you can take a screenshot and uh, follow up on any of these archive postings. And now I will go ahead and try to answer the question I started with, which is what have we learned? So. I've agreed completely with EHT that this is sort of the general picture you should have in mind. It's four to micro arc seconds in diameter, but we don't really know the width. We don't really know exactly where it's brightest. Um, and so what do we learn from this? Well, I mean, we shouldn't lose sight of the fa fact that, you know, we saw a black hole, right? <laughs> you know, okay, it wasn't the black hole shadow they claimed it was, but it's, it's the black hole. I mean, it's incredibly exciting, right? Um, it's not obscured. You see a hole in the image, you know, uh, that's amazing. And from that, you can bracket the mass. I, I think the tiny error bars given by EHT are an artifact of a tiny choice of model that they prefer, uh, but the error bars don't get that much bigger when you just sort of use heuristics to say, well, it can't be coming from in the horizon. It can't be coming from bigger than like eight or nine M because why would the emission stop there? You know, there's just no reason for that. Um, so you basically see a black hole of the expected mass, which is kind of amazing. And then going forward, the Doppler boosting and stuff suggests that the disk is kind of, it's a mildly inclined disk, but that's suggestive. And what can we do better going forward? Well, I think it's incredibly exciting to go look for this photon ring, which you can't see from EHT, you probably can't see it from the ground, maybe in the future, but from space, it'd be incredibly exciting. I've got a number of papers on that over the last couple of years. And we're going to have talks in the rest of the session on just moving forward from even this data set and future observations of the ground, trying to nail down the width of the ring and the position angle, which would really help uh, discriminate between different astrophysical scenarios. So I've left maybe a minute or two officially for extra questions. Thanks for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Sam. Thank you. It was a very nice talk. Yes, there is one question I see here um, from Alex Lupsaska. Uh, sorry, I just wanted to clap. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, sure. Oh, there is, uh, yeah, there is, a, there is one question on the chat. Also, the EHT collaboration mass for MMT7 is off from the, ga is off from the gas dynamics measurement. Does that signal theories beyond GR? No, I don't think you can include anything about can conclude anything about testing GR with this data set. It's just, uh, there's too much astrophysical uncertainty and too much noise in the data. I do think the, mat, the EHD data disfavor the gas dynamics mass, not by as much as the collaboration claims, but I do think they disfavor it. You, you can read my single author paper if you wanna know why I think you can't test GR. Thanks. I think Volker Perlick had his hand up if we have time. Yeah, I would like to ask about the possibility that actually what we see in the HD image is a hollow jet, that we are looking into a hollow jet. Some people have suggested this. I would like to hear your opinion on that. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, it's absolutely a, it's absolutely consistent with the data. Yes, yes. Uh, whether it's a reasonable possibility, you know, <laughs> I don't know too much about the modeling. I find it very strange, but for no good reason, the idea that you could have just a sheath lighting up right near the black hole and nothing else, which is kind of what you would need to get for the, for the main ring to be caused by the jet with no extra equatorial mission. It doesn't sort of seem feel right to me, but I really don't know, you know, maybe if it's a collisionless plasma, ultimately our intuition could be way off. Okay, thank you. Okay, we have last quick, quick question, please, um, Tamar. Um, yeah, just to follow up, you, you said that, uh... It, it, it's unreasonable to say that you can measure spin by lensing. So what would be other potential observables that you have in mind? I mean, whether can we even measure the spin from any of the EHT observations or NGHD or space or whatever? 
Well, EHT, no, not to my standards. I mean, I think it's clear for something like EHT that any effective spin is indirect. It's because of your emission, your astrophysical model happens to make a different emission profile, a different spin. I mean, that you can see by just making plots of the photon trajectories that EHT observes. They look identical, pretty much, almost all of them for spinning and non-spinning. Now for NGEHT, I don't know. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of claims in the literature about what an amazing dynamic range and Fourier coverage it's gonna have. So yeah, I mean, if you make really, really nice images, you could do stuff like look at the shape of the uh, hole in the middle in detail and try to, that might be different for a spinning black hole. I, so I'm not gonna say yes or no for those, but I think in the near future, it's unfortunately not very promising. It's much more interesting to go after astrophysical questions than black hole questions. Uh, so I don't want to use up time beyond mine, but there do seem to be more questions. What should I do? Well, there, there's going to be a, a discussion later on of the EHT images, and that may be where we can take the overflow questions here. That's right. So we can move to the next speaker. So Will Lockhart. All righty. How does that look? Can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can see <laughs> the screen and see you and hear you. So please. Great. Um, awesome. Well, thank you so much for having me. Um, it's really exciting. This is going to be the first um, talk I've given um, since we uh, wrote this paper that's going to be out uh, very soon. Um, and it's especially nice to have Sam's talk as an introduction because um, that that covers sort of some of the first slides and I can focus more on our um, results. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the geometric modeling um, that we did um, on the public EHT data. And as Sam has mentioned, we were specifically interested in uh, figuring out what we can learn about the width of the ring feature. Um, so, so I'll go through this first couple of slides very quickly since Sam sort of already covered it, but what is the HT? It's a radio interferometer. It measures these Fourier components. Um, we had saw some of these kind of plots just a moment ago um, of the coverage. Um, and it turns out that if, if you just look at the amplitude, so the visibilities are complex numbers. Um, and if you just plot their amplitudes, um, it turns out that that is already sort of suggestive of this uh, 40 micro arc second ring-like structure. It's not uh, necessarily a smoking gun, but there's sort of already, you can see some, some features. So that's just kind of something interesting to see. Um, but as far as, the data analysis is concerned. As Sam mentioned, there's sort of these two overall um, methods to, to modeling. So one um, we refer to as imaging, and the other is geometric modeling. And as, as Sam mentioned, the EHT collaboration did both. Um, and in terms of the sort of gross features of the image, um, they all, you know, there's sort of two features that are very robust. Um, the annular shape of a, about 40 micro arc seconds diameter, um, and a clear brightness asymmetry where the brighter side is toward the south. Um, and sort of the next, the next sort of natural question in our mind is, is the radio width, which as we already saw, um, there is not necessarily agreement between these methods. So that's what we're interested in, in probing. Um, and this is sort of, again, uh, sort of just another statement of these, these, this uncertainty. Um, okay, so what, what did we do? So our goal basically was to understand what constraints um, geometric modeling puts on the ring width. Um, and in particular, whether um, trying alternative, but equally, like, equally sort of valid um, ways of, of modeling might um, affect the results. So we sort of tried two things, which I'll get into in detail in a moment, but just to flash them up now. Um, 
when you're fitting a model, you construct what's called a likelihood function, which tells you how likely a given choice of parameters is relative to other choices. Um, so we try to modify some, we found sort of a modification of the likelihood function that we thought was reasonable. Um, so that's one thing that we tried differently. And then the other thing is um, to vary how the lowest signal to noise data points are handled because um, there are certain approximations that sort of break down at low SNR and that, you know, could that be biasing the data? So that's sort of two of the modifications that we did in our geometric um, analysis compared to um, what EHTC had already done. Um, okay, so first let me tell you the model that we used. So this is the collaborations, um, what's called uh, eccentric slashed ring or excess ring for short, the excess ring model. Um, and as Sam described, this is really not an astrophysical model. Um, it's merely a way of sort of parameterizing reasonable image shapes, right? So we're in his graphic, we're starting with, with the, the image as our modeling space, not the, not the source itself. So the EHT model um, is built in the following way. So first we take um, a uniform disk of brightness, and you can see those cross sections on the top and to the right. Um, and that has a variable size. We cut out a smaller disk, which again can vary. Um, there's an overall shift. This is maybe a little hard to see, but you can see the, you can shift that where, where you cut, make that cut out. Um, the central brightness depression can have a floor. So we're not, we're not automatically assuming that that this is ring-like, the floor, you know, the center is allowed to be just as bright as the rest. Um, and then we'll find that, of course, it does prefer a ring-like a ring -like shape. Um, then there's a gradient and a rotation and finally a blur. Um, and so this is sort of the seven parameter excess ring model. Um, and then on top of that, we follow the EHT collaboration and we add what are called nuisance parameters, which in this case, take the form of Gaussians. Um, and essentially the idea here is just that we sort of know going in that this model with only seven parameters, you know, we can't expect sort of a perfect fit to the data when the source, you know, is, is likely to have all kinds of more complicated features. And so the idea is that you add these nuisance parameters and then you sort of hope that the posteriors you get for your, your real parameters of interest are not altered too much by the additional freedom of the nuisance parameters. And that sort of just helps justify that, that you can in fact get good fits with this model. So, um, so that's, this, is, this is our model. So, okay, so we wanna fit the data using this model. Um, so what do we do? Um, so the first, the first thing is that, um, I think Sam showed this, this noise formula. And so unfortunately, these, these calibration errors, these so-called gain terms, GI and GJ star here in this top equation, um, make things very difficult to just model the visibilities themselves, just fit to the visibilities, because you don't know these gains. And so some people have, are modeling, are sort of incorporating the gain terms as unknown parameters, um, but there's a lot of them. And so that makes things complicated. So an alternative approach that we used um, is to use what are called closure quantities. And these are the closure phase and the closure amplitude, or uh, more convenient is the log of the closure amplitude. And these have sort of an amazing property that if you construct these closure quantities, um, then the gain terms disappear from the mean of, of each, of those, each of those quantities. Um, and that essentially just happens because of how, how these Gs appear in this formula with the conjugate. conjugate. So um, the advantage of using closure quantities is you've, you've mostly eliminated the gains from, from your model. Um, however, there are some subtleties. So this is where the first modification comes in um, that, I, that I hinted at about, about the likelihood function. So, um, so hopefully I'll, I'll be able to explain this subtlety. So basically, um, if you think about a single measurement, so for example, suppose we had a single measurement um, of the phase of a visibility, um, then the likelihood is just a, a Gaussian. Um, 
And so it, it kind of looks like this, where um, you have this uh, uncertainty, sigma, sigma phi here, um, which looks like the error on the amplitude divided by the, the, the actual amplitude. Um, and so the key is that when you're dealing with closure quantities, closure phases or closure amplitudes, then you have a very similar likelihood formula. It's a Gaussian, but the errors are more complicated. They come from propagating the error um, through the, the closure formula, and you get something like this bottom equation um, where they depend on these, these amplitude signal to noise ratios. And so the issue is that what we really want. Uh, if we were doing this likelihood formulation correctly, is we want V to be the mean visibilities one would actually measure given the model. Um, and the problem is that that, if we, just, if we just take the mean of this VIJ, we still have gain terms um, appearing in that, in that, that formula. Um, and so basically, we sort of stumbled upon this and said, okay, it seems like there's sort of two reasonable things to do from here. One could either um, just drop the gain terms, sort of assume that they're small um, or assume that they're very close to one um, and use the model visibility um, in our closure uncertainty formula. Um, or we could do what uh, the collaboration did, which is to just use the measured visibility. Um, just use capital VIJ instead of the script, script V. Um, and so we refer to these as the fixed likelihood and the variable likelihood. And so that's sort of one of the main things I'm gonna show results comparing um, are these two likelihood formulations. Remember this, this, what, this the formula is appearing just in the uncertainty on our closure quantities, um, but that, that has an important effect. So um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna skip ahead. I hope that made any sense at all. <laughs> but that's these just if you can sort of just think of it as as sort of there's two different approximations that both seem reasonable um, for how to how to do a likelihood function when you're not explicitly modeling the gain terms. Okay, so the second thing that we tried differently is what to do with low signal to noise points. So on the figure on the right, um, you see the visibility amplitudes for one of the data sets um, sorted by S by SNR. And you see that, you know, there's a number of points that are below about three. And that's when um, these closure phase uncertainty formulas sort of start to break down in the first place. Um, so, you know, it's not clear that we can necessarily trust them. Um, and another, the other problem is that when you're exploring a model, if your model is some simple ring shape, you can actually sort of have arbitrarily small SNRs near these near these nulls around three giga lambda and eight giga lambda. Um, and these are important because this is sort of part of what's probably telling us that there's a ring structure in the first place. So we should kind of pay attention to how these points are handled. Um, and so what we did is we compared three sort of three different analyses in general. So one is the fixed likelihood, which is just reproducing what a subset of what EHD did. Another is using our variable likelihood um, as long as the signal to noise is above a certain cutoff. And then the third option is to use the variable likelihood and simply throw away low SNR points because we don't trust them, let's say. Um, and so basically we wanted to explore these three options and just see what is robust and what is not and, and sort of quantify potential bias here. Okay, so I have a few more minutes. Let me show you some results. So. Um, this is this is just uh, an example of an individual run. Um, so we did many different runs with these three different approaches, and we used two different samplers, and we did all the different data sets. So there's a whole whole sort of library of of results that I'll summarize. But this is just an example of what an individual run looks like. Um, so we produce a best fit image, um, and the closure phase and log closure amplitude, you know, fits. Um, and then we can produce uh, what's called a corner plot, which shows um, the posteriors on, on, on uh, what we're interested in. So we sort of focused on a few quantities. So there's the diameter of the disk, 
the, I labeled it angle, it's just the direction of the brightest point. Um, and then we looked at the fractional width. And then finally, we looked at the ratio of flux in the ring to um, the total flux that includes those nuisance parameters. Um, so that just gives a sense of like, is this image dominated by a ring or is it dominated by blurry nuisance stuff? Um, and so the interesting thing, so this just shows one particular example um, where the red is a variable likelihood and the blue is a fixed likelihood. And you can see that in this case, for this particular run, um, the diameter and the brightness direction are very consistent, whereas the width and the flux fraction are, are clearly discrepant. Um, and so that's kind of exciting. So this, again, is just for an individual run. Um, and now we're going to look at sort of all the runs together and see if there's any overall, um, anything we can conclude overall. So here is um, the full results of our simulations, again, for a particular data set, which is the April 6th high band. And so you can see these four quantities, diameter, angle, width, and ratio, flux ratio. And, you know, to some extent, it's, it's things are a little all over the place. But one of the, you know, sort of things that jumps out is in the last two quantities, just like in the previous plot, we saw there was a discrepancy between um, the fixed likelihood, which is gray in this plot, and the variable likelihoods, which are the different colored options. Um, here we can see sort of this clear separation. Um, and so I'm uh, hopefully not going too fast, but I'll now show the final plot, which is basically we have one, you know, what I'm showing here is, is all the simulations for a given data set, and there are eight data sets. And so we what we did is we wanted to sort of make a master plot of um, looking at at all the data sets comparing against each other. And for each one, um, we basically average together all of the fixed likelihood results and all of the variable likelihood results. And so that's this kind of master plot. Um, so this, this plot, this is essentially what we lead with in, in the, the paper. And this kind of summarizes everything. Um, and so um, basically we can kind of see the, the main results. So, so basically, the way that I, I sort of interpret this plot is the diameter is very consistent. All the different data sets and different fixed and variable likelihoods sort of agree. Um, the angle uh, changes over time, which is something that the collaboration noticed, um, which is very interesting and, and suggests that there could actually be, since this is over the course of a week between April 5th and April 11th, you know, could this actually be a change in the in what's happening in the source rather than rather than in the rather than in the experiment. Not sure, um, but it's still the variable and the fixed likelihoods, the black versus the the open um, uh, points agree. Um, but with fractional width and flux fraction up on the bottom, we we do maintain a pretty clear separation um, where the fixed likelihood of the EHT collaboration is consistently predicting thinner rings, rings with you know, something like a fractional width of 0.2, whereas our variable likelihoods are something more like 0.3 or even 0.4. And so the takeaway for me is basically um, to the extent that these two formulations, the fixed and the variable likelihoods are equally sort of equally valid approximations, um, there seems to be a bias in, there seems to be a, a, a bias about what they predict for the, the width of the ring. Um, and so I think more research is needed to understand, you know, which of these approaches is actually better, or if some, there could be some third approach, or perhaps, perhaps gain modeling really is needed, and so on. Um, but this sort of gives perhaps some insight into why the geometric modeling from EHT um, predicts rings that are so thin. Um, so I'll leave, I'll stop there and, and uh, leave it for questions. Hey, thank you, Will, um, for your presentation. So let's see, let's see if there is any questions from the audience. Is there any questions? Okay. I, I, 
we have also, we'll have the discussion session also. Okay, great. Yes, um, after the, yes, after the next talk, so. Uh, so there is no, there are no questions. We can move to the next talk. And thank you for being on time. So, Christoph, here you are. Okay. Um, yes. All right. So, um, hello, everybody. When, no, when if you are ready, just you share your screen and and you can start. Okay. Um, can you see everything okay? Yes, everything is okay. Yes. Hi, right, so um, I want to present uh, uh, the results of my independent look uh, at, the, at the image of uh, M87. And um, I mean, there, that, that's basically uh, reporting one, um, one, one publication and then some thoughts uh, related to recent uh, developments. Okay, so um, well, I have a, I have a, a jet bias uh, to M eighty uh, seven because it's a, it's it's one of the most studied uh, astrophysical jets um, uh, that we can follow in uh, great detail and uh, has been studied on on a lot of scales. What I what I want to uh, what, I, what I have in mind uh, thinking about M87 is um, that, that the jet has a very well defined uh, direction on the sky and uh, which, 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 uh, which you can see on, uh, on, on these images, they are properly aligned so that the position angle of the jet uh, that we see uh, up to the kiloparsec scales uh, is 288 uh, degrees. And we also think we have a we have a, view, a good idea about the viewing angle, uh, which is about 18 degrees, uh, making this object uh, uh, not quite a blazer, uh, not so much uh, jet dominated. Uh, but uh, we associate, we, as, we, we, we also are kind of uh, biased uh, to associate the jet direction with uh, the black hole spin. Um, even though it is not a blazer, as I mentioned, it shows some variability in uh, at higher uh, energies, uh, including uh, very high energy gamma rays. Uh, and uh, it has been uh, observed by uh, Cherenkov telescopes and uh, uh, was showing flares with uh, variability timescales down to about uh, two days, which for, uh, for, for the black hole mass that we know right now is, is uh, corresponding to about uh, five uh, gravitational radii, um, which, 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 uh, which means basically that, well, some of this activity uh, may, may be produced very close, uh, very close to the black hole. Okay, so um, the image, uh, the image uh, of M87 that was ob obtained by the, by the EHT, uh, it's covering a period of six days. We, we, we have uh, like um, basically uh, four, uh, four uh, observations um, and um, they show some, they show some, some uh, variations that I will, uh, I will, uh, I will uh, discuss a bit uh, later on. Uh, but it is, it is a, it is a, it is a crescent and, uh, and, and, and uh, what, what interested me uh, in particular is how is this crescent related to uh, to the uh, to the uh, direction of the, the large scale jet a jet that is that is uh, that is of course uh, uh, extending to 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 uh, uh, much greater scales. Um, so there is this 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 image somewhere in 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 uh, in EHT paper four which shows uh, like. Uh, uh, angular profiles of uh, total emi emission along the along the ring. So um, this shows uh, three different uh, image reconstruction algorithms. Uh, their, their results uh, of, of different uh, algorithms. There are even more algorithms now with with uh, with, with polarization. But 
basically um, some of them, uh, especially uh, to, to, to say shortly, uh, especially the EHT imaging, which seems to be a favorite algorithm, um, shows the brightest, uh, the brightest feature uh, located at, at in the in what I what I refer to as the uh, ESE sector, so east southeast, um, and that that's the brightest feature uh, in that algorithm. Um, also in uh, another one, not not uh, not in the uh, in in the diff, diff map though. Well, so I thought um, about this feature as um, possibly a, a hotspot. Let me just call it a hotspot. If it's real or not, you, you see. I mean, it's not. Uh, it's not so obvious, but it's it's located at a very very stable, uh, for, very stable uh, position um, along the along the ring. Now, um, the EHT um, has produced a lot of these uh, images from GRMHD simulations, and um, they actually some of them some of them uh, could be. At least made oriented um, roughly in a way to uh, to to match the this uh, brightest point uh, in the image. Uh, but on average, when when you when you average all the images and and consider now, if when you do simulation, you know uh, you know where your uh, black uh, black hole spin axis uh, is 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 located. So you can compare. A distribution of of uh, those uh, positions of the black hole axis with the jet uh, direction, which is uh, which is this uh, gray, gray band. Um, so so uh, on average, if you have uh, if you have uh, if you have uh, uh, the spin pointing away from us, um, then uh, then there is some 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 offset, but it's uh, as they say it's it's about 1.5 sigma offset. It's not it's not not statistically significant. Um, so so uh, but 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 there is there is there is a bit of uh, there is a bit of disagreement here. Okay, so um, so this is this is my uh, let's say uh, just just visual analysis of of the image um, dissecting uh, the, this uh, ring into some uh, sectors and 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 in particular showing here the direction of of the jet and the jet jet is pointing basically to the uh, to the right hand side or to the west side of of the image and uh, you in this uh, this average plot, uh, image you can see uh, two major features so one is the is a kind of main crescent on the south uh, to to southwest uh, sectors, and and uh, possibly a distinct uh, hotspot uh, on the ESC. So uh, yes, so um, uh, I, I I did my own uh, code uh, that was able to to do some ray tracing in a curve metric. And was trying to answer a question whether whether such images can be produced with uh, intrinsically uh, axisymmetric models, and what I tried to uh, distinguish here were models where emission is uh, is oriented along uh, the equatorial plane. And by the way, in all of these models, the black hole uh, there were, there were some sp some spin values were assumed, but the but the spin axis was uh, fixed. Uh, to the best, uh, best, uh, our best knowledge of the of the jet direction. So, um, if you look at the lower of those plots, which are uh, which are the equatorial disk cases, um, they most naturally can 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 produce uh, this uh, south southwest uh, crescent, uh, but they lack emission uh, in the ESC uh, sector. The polar caps, which are which are involved here um, in in connection, in particular in connection with those with those rapid gamma ray variations, but I, but I I just don't want to say any any more about it because you 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 hear talks by uh, Benoit and and Benjamin, um, but but uh, these are just very simple toy models 
uh, of polar caps, they they allow you to 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 shift um, the crescent uh, orientation towards the eastern side, uh, which is because you can you can you can see here um, the uh, the cap that is located um, uh, along along the counter jet or or the cap the, the the cap from which photons have to have to go around. Uh, the black hole and they are boosted actually because we assume some some kind of uh, some kind of info uh, onto onto the black hole. However, those those images just are, are just not um, not entirely consistent with with uh, what we see here. So it was not not particularly successful uh, exercise, uh, and I think that this feature, if true, uh, must must be. Uh, some kind of uh, perturbation uh, due, due to natural variations, um, possibly, possibly, uh, possibly somebody can find a way to to uh, prove or disprove that feature uh, by using closure phases. I, I I was not not able to do that, um, but now I want to want to um, to uh, tell you about uh, polarization. I, I when I took a Took a look at the polarimetric observations from EHT that appeared this year. It's uh, what was striking to me is that polarization is seen almost everywhere except the ESC sector. I mean, except this this uh, uh, this uh, this feature, which I think is interesting uh, and and might be an argument for uh, for for. Uh, for uh, for the existence of a distinct uh, structure there, um, but uh, why why is there is there uh, low polarization? A low polarization degree is is a general problem of uh, M eighty seven, as I read in in in, in uh, EHT papers. Uh, there is uh, basically uh, in in all basic scenarios some depolarization is um, is expected. But but uh, well here uh, this ESC sector should have additional uh, depolarization. So I tried to estimate how much uh, how much additional uh, Faraday dispersion uh, measure you uh, you require for that. And uh, I think that well basically it should not should should not require much more than ten to six radians per uh, meter square, which is which should not be too difficult or or or, or too constraining uh, to uh, to achieve um, using uh, and and it's just a, a bit more than than what is uh, what is reported, especially from Alma. Possibly in one case there is a, uh, there, this um, low high bands uh, may indicate uh, even ten to seven radians per meter square, but I, I understand that this is not. Uh, uh, not uh, not that certain. And now, uh, finally, um, some consideration of of, of the va variations of the image. So I mentioned six days of of, of observations, and uh, some parameters can be we can probe uh, some some angles uh, as they as they change over that uh, time, and and in particular. When we when we look at the EVPA, which is the, the the observed polarization angle, especially with ALMA, which is the unresolved uh, uh, polarization, um, that shows some rather rather slow uh, variation. But then we when when we correct for uh, the rotation for the Faraday rotation, uh, it actually turns out that this intrinsic angle uh, called chi zero. Uh, is showing is showing a, a faster uh, rotation rate, and it actually appears to coincide with with the rotation rate of the of the uh, of of the mean uh, mean angle co uh, computed from the from the total intensity image, uh, which was which was uh, which was done in uh, uh, the fourth paper of of the collaboration. Uh, it looks like like uh, like a uh, Curious coincidence that we might have here a rotation rate of about four degrees per day, which uh, which would uh, which which corresponds to 
the period, the orbital period of about uh, 90 days or uh, 250 uh, gravitational radii, uh, which corresponds to a circular orbit of about uh, 12 gravitational radii. So it's a bit uh, far um, compared, for example, with uh, Sagittarius A star and the gravity result, which 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 uh, showed the uh, which showed the rotation uh, period of about 120, uh, 120 uh, gravitational radii. Uh, that that uh, that that means uh, about seven gravitational radii. However, uh, this is uh, this is uh, one uh, more image from uh, paper seven, and these are the resolved polarization angles, and they are a bit more uncertain or or uh, well. Again, depend on the algorithm uh, and may depend on the on the band. There is not so much quality here, uh, but uh, this might suggest a rotation rate of uh, about 7.5 degrees per day, which would mean uh, 130 gravitational radii uh, period and 7.5 uh, uh, of circular radius, which which I think is is. Uh, Again, quite quite interesting. Um, I should just my last uh, thought is that um, the uh, the the hotspot as seen in those reconstructed images is not showing uh, is, is 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 it does not appear to be rotating nearly as fast, which which uh, makes me uh, puzzled again. So. Uh, so I am uh, quite confused, but but uh, would be would be fun to to see if uh, if, if if such uh, such uh, findings can be confirmed. I think we definitely need a, a significantly longer observing campaign uh, to address those uh, questions. Uh, so this is my reference or my email, and I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you for attention. Hello. May, may I ask a question? Um, yes, please. Okay, yeah, uh, thank you, Krzysztof. This is Benoit. Um, I was just wondering about the, uh, your interpretation that you've explored regarding the, uh, the polar cap uh, emission uh, as a possible source for the hotspot. Um, Right in, on this slide. So, uh, so what height uh, do you need for the the source to be? Because uh, I'm asking this question because I would naively mm -hmm. expect that if you are too close to the black hole at this nearly face-on orientation, you would see this hotspot like closer inside the dark region. Yes, um, that's a good question. And at the moment, I, I I just forgot what is what is the R max, uh, which which I which I which I indicate, uh, but I can. I can I can write you uh, in a chat in a few minutes if I if you may. Yeah. Okay, sure. Yeah. Thanks. We have a question from Benoit. Uh, yeah, we just we just uh, had that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I just asked the question. Thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. So. Sorry. Okay. Uh, there is any other question? No. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, Christoph. So we have now um, a discussion, discussion session with the EHT images. So Brian, and I, I ask if you can share the, the, the discussion. Okay. Uh, okay, that's not what I wanted to do. Uh, yes, yeah, so... Uh, the first thing that I noticed, I kind of saved my questions and comments until this part. Uh, and hopefully Christoph is still there too. Uh, so the, the first thing was Sam's talk. Uh, the, he, I don't think he emphasizes one thing enough. Uh, the original EHT papers talked about a photon ring. That was the headline, the photon, we found the photon ring and this shows us, you know, the 
uh, all these theories for Bardeen, everything was right and all this kind of stuff. But the, what Sam was saying is the, uh, he mentioned the word demagnetized and he talked about the intensity is basically conserved up to the, the red shifting of the energy along each ray. And so what happens is, is that the intensity of the entire backside of the disc is actually the same as on the backside of the disc, but now it's in a very small solid angle. So astronomers use this idea as he brought up, and I'm certainly no expert on because I had a very hard time understanding this. I first started taking uh, astronomy. Uh, I started as an, I first was in astronomy before I became a physicist, but they def define the flux per solid angle, and which is the intensity or surface brightness, because when, and it's a solid angle of the observer. So the solid angle gets really far, small for objects far away, and that naturally allows you to convert from flux at the source to Earth. And so the intensity is the same, but it's now in this very small solid angle observed from Earth. So the flux of this photon ring is virtually nothing. It's very small compared to the direct uh, image that's coming out. So basically all you're seeing to, to like 90% uh, certainty, which is probably higher than the certainty of the entire image, <laughs> is that you're just seeing the direct flux and it's just being slightly shifted by the plus one. And I, I don't I don't think Sam emphasized that enough, but that's just my opinion. Is any, so I just want to make sure everyone was listening. That was very clear because that's really the punchline of the whole thing. That's what demystifies a lot of what's happening. Uh, the other thing from uh, Sam's talk, so I'll throw these out to see if it gives anyone any, any interest in bringing up their own topics here is uh, if you had a mission inside of uh, 2M, well, 2M, remember, with the plus one, looks like the 3M, which is more or less the beginning of, the, of this uh, annular region. Uh, it's so dependent on the red shifting. There's a lot of red shifting there. And so it becomes completely model dependent. That would be very difficult to pin down that source uh, from the EHT observations, no matter what they are, because it's there are these other dynamical factors that just overwhelm everything else. Am I getting this right, Sam? I mean, yeah, there's definitely a lot of redshift. It's hard to learn, it's hard to see much from that region. Yeah, but I, I think with the higher sensitivity, they is, when they get these intermediate baselines, uh, they will, they might start seeing some fuzz. They might, so this leads to my next thing. If they do do see some fuzz, uh, and this is basically the, the problem with this whole thing. It's it's a simplification, but in the end, for deconvolving what the pre-image of all this is, is is the fact that it's face on. So if you see a bunch of fuzz later on, on the outside and the inside, you don't know how far in front in the foreground this stuff is. You have no idea. You don't know if it's near the black hole or way up. So, okay, Christoph has an answer of 6RG. Does that mean anything to you, Benoit? <laughs> yeah, I think that makes sense then with the, uh, with the fact that it can be close to the edge of the, of the ring rather than if it's uh, an one RG above the, the black hole, that would be more difficult to, to have it so offset, given the uh, nearly face on orientation. So, so one of the things from uh, Christoph's talk that, that struck me, when you look at the, at the image in a contour image, so he was able to make a contour image out of it. Did, did everyone notice how incredibly faint the, the upper hemisphere is and the con, with the line contours? I mean, it's, and the image only has a, like a factor of 10 dynamic range, but it, it's, it's very striking. And the thing that I've been trying to get is the, uh, 
is the contour image with the negative contours. I can't get this from the EHT group uh, because we really don't know. I don't know. Most of the people here are physicists. And so the, the things like intensity seem kind of spooky. But the other thing is what radio images. A lot of physicists have never seen a lot of radio images before. And the only way that radio astronomers over the years have been able to tell the quality of a radio image in a paper is when they see these negative contours. That tells you just the errors in the reconstruction process. I mean, you can see the magnitude of them. And I don't know if they're like at the third contour on Christoph's map or at the fifth contour. I think, I don't know how many contours you got in there, maybe 10. So that, that would make a big difference in how to interpret like the hot spot that he found. And I think uh, the other thing that's uh, interesting is the, right, Christoph is more of the jet person here, of the, the group, is that he's, when you, you look at the polarization, that polarization has to be coming from the, uh, the same emission that's putting out the, the, uh, just the total intensity. There's nothing else there. It's gotta be the same stuff. And it led to a question. I mean, we can't even really assume, I know, I know Sam was against this, that, that it's, it's a disc. I mean, it's just something that's annular and there's that giant jet right there. I mean, someone asked about the hollow jet. I mean, it's hard to avoid the fact that that's what you see. You see basically, you know there's a jet and you see an annulus at the bottom. And the jet, you know, is hollow the whole way through. If you look at these images of the jet, there's nothing in the middle. And so it's got these two bright edges and it comes down to this annulus. And suddenly they're not related, which is possible. I mean, but you can't rule it out out of hand because if those, if it is the jet and it is radiating, you know, at three to five M out, you know, near its base, no one knows, it would look exactly the same. It could be suspended like 20 M above the whole thing and coming out of a thick disc or something. It would all look the same. That's what Sam's uh, images showed us that the, you can't differentiate between any of these possibilities because you're just seeing, just seeing direct emission and you're just looking straight down on it. So they all, all this stuff looks almost exactly the same. So I, I, can, I can tell something. There's, uh, there's a contrast of about 25, I think, between the, the compact image and the jet uh, uh, bright, uh, I mean, uh, surface br brightness. When you look at uh, three, millimeter, uh, three millimeter images, uh, from uh, other group, uh, then 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 you have that, and also uh, there are there are nice simulations by I think uh, Moschibroska and uh, et al, which show you what you would see at uh, other other wavelengths as well. And so as you go to longer wavelengths, you see you see the jet structure more clearly because uh, of course then uh, we we might be um, I mean, somewhere close to, uh, you know, opacity effects might 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 also be involved, and 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 so in, in at this wavelength, it's uh, you may not really have a direct view of of everything there is. Okay, so what I, what I would say to that, so that, that that's true. There are simulations that show that, uh, and we'll talk about the the, the brightness. Uh, of the jet. So the uh, so the simulations that show that this is it's true. You can make a sim simulation, but I was thinking more in terms of Sam's idea is you don't you don't make it so model dependent that you just look at what the the ray tracing tells you. So in terms of the the brightness, if you go to the you showed the 86 gigahertz image of Hada in your talk, right? I think he has 650 millijanskis at 86 gigahertz. Uh, and I think he fits a size of like a Gaussian size to the core of 60 
uh, uh, milli arc seconds, full width half maximum. Now you're looking at the rails farther up, but he he's he when you look at the unresolved core, uh, the size I think I think was about sixty micro arcs uh, micro arc seconds. I meant to say, which is pretty similar. But on the other hand, too, it might be uh, an inverted spectrum as well. Now that thing that's what's what is that core that he sees in that image? Is that just the disk merged with the jet? I mean, we don't know what the 86 gigahertz image is. There is a new 86 gigahertz image, which I wanted to get access to for this uh, talk. Uh, that includes the Greenland telescope and, and ALMA. The people have this image already know what this thing looks like. <laughs> and so that, when they talk about seeing the jet, that's the, I don't know if that's technically called the 86, the 86 gigahertz global VM, uh, global VLBI image, if that's considered the event horizon telescope or not. Maybe now that they might. I mean, how do you know? I don't know when it turns over to the event horizon telescope, maybe at 120 gigahertz or something. But that uh, will have 50 micro arc seconds uh, resolution, the, the synthesized beam. And uh, they want to over-resolve it, super-resolve it. I know there's an interest in doing that. And using one of the things that EHT came up with, they want to get down to 25, I think about 25 micro arc seconds. So it'll be 86 gigahertz. Image. That's why I was asking about the fuzz. If you saw something fuzzy, around the, this annulus, as when I asked Sam, I said, if you look straight down on it, you're looking straight down on it, you wouldn't have any idea where the fuzz is coming from. It's just a bunch of fuzz. You know, I don't, I don't know about the wisps, the, the uh, helical wisps that come out of the, uh, the simulations and stuff like that, but for the jet. But, it's, you know, that I, I think it's very unknown, and that would have been a great thing to have for this conference. Does anyone know what it looks like? 86 gigahertz images in the audience. It looks like we have a question by Paul, Paul Kerr. Yeah, actually, it's not uh, immediately related to the last remarks. It's about the question about ver uh, jet versus disk. And uh, we know very well that M87 has a jet. It has the most marvelous jet which we ever observed in the sky, right? Do we really know that there is a disk? I'm not sure about this. So I really would like to know, there are some, I think there are some observers in the audience. I would really like to know from the side of the observers, do we really have evidence, really strict evidence that there is a disk? So, or is it really a possibility that what we see is just a jet? So that's, that's what, uh, what, what I- um, Can I uh, add to that? Yeah, okay. It's, it's, it's sure, the same sure. question. Uh, Brian also mentioned observational evidence that the jet is hollow. That I did not know about. That would certainly change my mind. You know, it's just what strikes me is the jet is hollow in the GRMHD simulations because they turn off the emission by hand in the jet. Okay, that's not very convincing. But if it's, you know, hollow on larger scales, that's a big difference. So what's the story observationally? So observationally, you see when you go to 86 gigahertz, even the really good 43 gigahertz uh, uh, images with VLBA, I recommend the paper I just posted. <laughs> it has an incredible 43 gigahertz image. You can even see the counter jet. Just looks like these two rails and yes. back in the middle. Now on the front side, the, the approaching jet, I should say, you see two rails, but the core is so bright. When you get real close, it starts to fill in a little bit because you're just seeing the, the brightness of the core it just being blurred by the restoring beam, but it's still, it's dominated by two rails uh, pretty far out, like, like a light year out at least. And then it starts getting more murky, but it's still the rail, the rails are completely dominant on the inside. And there's lots, people have lots of reasons, depending on what your preference is theory wise, lots of reasons why this happens. But uh, if, if Bart, uh, and some of these 
other simulators. I don't know if Bart ever showed up to give his talk. He might have some ideas as to why with his simulations. I don't know if he ever showed up yet. Excuse me, may I, may I repeat my question? Does anybody have really strict evidence from any kind of observations that there's a disk around M87, around the center of M87? No, I, I think even if you look at the EH, if you look at the EH, I'm sorry, if you look at the EHT paper, I think it might be paper five. Yes. Uh, they show that one of the possible models is one of the possible models. Exactly, that's the point. <laughs> one of the possible models. Yes, I completely agree. <laughs> yeah, they had they had one. They called it the same. Yes, yes, I've read this very carefully. Yes, it's perfectly consistent. I agree with that. But the question is, can you also explain the same observations in a completely different way? If I you just, same, as a hypothesis, this... say we are looking into the hollow jet and there's no disk whatsoever. Is this really a possibility? That's what I would like to know. Well, that figure says yes. Yes, yes. You're saying does a, does a disk not even exist? Yes, yes. It's, not? it's well, a possibility or is it not? There has to be anybody... some, some source of the plasma has to get in there somehow. Yeah, it's a jet. The jet is the plasma, of course. Yeah. Well, I, I guess it could be all electrodynamic. Like the plasma could be all be very far out. I know there's some yeah, models. It's yeah. completely electrodynamic yeah. situation. You usually need something to hold the magnetic field for you, right? The black hole can't hold the magnetic field. Yeah, so I mean, the plasma would be much farther out. It would make a large electrodynamic region that's much bigger than the black hole. And yeah, Roger Blanford is working on this ejection disk idea, he calls it. It's okay. a much more distant disk, and then there's a clutch near the black hole where all the emission comes from. But well, moment, is it true other, what I'm uh, saying? At the moment, you cannot rule out that there's no disk whatsoever. It's just a jet. It's a possibility at the moment. Or is this wrong? Well, at some point, there has to be a disk farther out. There has to be something holding this thing together. Because as... Sam points out this, uh, or somebody pointed out that the, uh, it was Sam that you have to have something to hold the magnetic field because a black hole can't hold okay, the magnetic field. Okay, there must field. be a magnetic field. Yes, I see. Okay. Yeah, so to, to, my knowledge, <laughs> to, to my knowledge, there's no spectral uh, feature that tells you that there's, there's an accretion flow in there. Like there's no direct evidence from a spectral point of view. Uh, but indeed, from a reasonable point of view, there's probably matter in there that is holding the magnetic field, as polarization okay. is telling us. So, but whether there's a kind of a structured disk, uh, to me, is not clear at all. And probably, it's probably something more puffy or something like that. And even if there is a disk, how do we know that, it, that it's radi radiating at 1.3 millimeters or 200, right. degree, whatever the observation is, right? I mean, there could, as far, I don't know much about accretion, but... It seems like. May, may yeah. I, ha I have a question? Um, uh, I see. I see that you have guys still there are around doubts, or let's see, there is a discussion, ongoing discussion on the uh, images on uh, on uh, of M eighty seven. So I can't imagine <laughs> what the discussion will be with the. Uh, uh, results from Sagittarius A. What do you, what, what do you expect from that? What, what was that? What, what do we what did we expect? To add? What, what are you expecting from the possible images of uh, from uh, Sagittarius A from our galactic center? Well, I, I think so. I Nothing. Think so. Data. <laughs> but uh, well, I mean, it's a very different object. I mean, they try to make it seem very similar. There's, as far as I know, there's no jet in Sagittarius A. Yeah. There's still debate about this. I know I, I still believe that. I, I know there is people, <laughs> people claim it, but because yeah. uh, they see like a variation in emission or something like that. But there's not. Yes. There's elongated structure that dominates the sky. It's not, it's not as marvelous jet as in M87, definitely not, yes. It's accreting also much less uh, than M87. Yes. And there is some uh, blur uh, expected. I think there, there are some 
problems with with, with processing these these images. Uh, oh. So that uh, we may not have a sharp image. Uh, hmm. uh, yes. Yeah. Good. I think we are we are just on time to to restart our session. It's time now. Uh, Six ten p.m. Uh, we should we should restart. So that's Chandra, right? Thanks for the discussion. We so we are yes. Oh, here we are. Oh, okay. So it's Chandra uh, yeah, Bahadur or next speaker. Yeah, yeah. So, so when you are ready, just you. Okay. You can, so you can start your presentation. I can, okay. I think you can see my screen. <clears throat> yes, we see it. Okay, so shall I start? Okay, so so that, uh, I would like to thank the organizers for the invitation, and so uh, my talk is going to be something dif different from what uh, has been discussed till now. So I would like to focus on uh, the importance of uh, magnetic reconnection process in uh, jet acquisition disk systems. And we did some uh, analytical as well as simulation works, uh, uh, which I did in collaboration with these collaborators. Uh, so as we know that uh, the black holes uh, are associated, generally associated with uh, jet emission, and these jets are supposed to be the accelerators uh, of relativistic particles and leading to relativistic particles, and also the high, uh, very high energy emissions. So these, these systems can uh, be present in uh, black hole X-ray binaries or GRBs or Asians. So while uh, from, from some uh, uh, solutions as well as simulations, there have been some, uh, some, some sort of consensus that how the jet formation can happen. So it is possible that the jet formation can happen and stay, stay collimated and can, can accelerate the uh, uh, the, I mean to say the bulk motion can have the Lorentz factor much, much greater than one, which leads to uh, the, the, the stability of jet up to mega particle scale. And so how the outflows in jets can be really accelerated is so mainly there are two um, well-recognized processes uh, like a magnetic centrifugal acceleration, which can, which can cause the outflows from accretion disk, while uh, there can be possibility of there can be possibility of powering the jet by black hole spin or uh, in another framework, it can be also driven by uh, ergosphere. So however, these processes are uh, so that these, these jets are quite stable and also the, it, remains to, to be, it, it remains to be pointing flux dominated or in other sense, magnetically dominated all along the flow. So the one major issue is that how this, uh, the con there should be some co kind of convergence. So, so the magnetic energy can go get into the ki kinetic energy. So one of the possibilities is the reconnection should be prevalent in this kind of system. So and another issue is that how to accelerate the particles and emissions. So when we consider the like so shock accelerations, it is difficult to um, uh, have very high energy in TeV. And also, especially if you think about magnetically dominated, dominated regions where, where the shocks can be weak also. So there, the reconnection play, can play some equally important role. So the one a simple picture of reconnection is that the magnetic field lines can approach from, suppose in this cartoon diagram, uh, from above and below, and then they can undergo some kind of destruction or the change in their topology. So during this process, uh, there can be uh, a, a release of magnetic energy, uh, so which can which can be eventually converted into radiation or of kinetic energy in the system. So in observation, it is usually found that this reconnection has to be fast. Mainly, what I mean to say is the the, the velocity of uh, reconnection, mainly the the velocity with which the magnetic field lines approach each other, should be order of alpha and speed. So how to make it fast? So and then if you think about shock acceleration, there can be a 
uh, velocity discontinuity or a jump in uh, velocity and there the, the particles can get accelerated and the gain in energy can be of order of, uh, uh, of first order of uh, shock velocity. While in case of a reconnection, there can be similar process where the, the current seat uh, can have a magnetic field discontinuity and the particle can enter in this region and they can get accelerated. Where uh, in this picture, it, uh, it is, uh, it, I, I mean, I missed to show it, but the magnetic field lines are supposed to be going in and out of the plane in opposite direction. And the velocity of uh, reconnection velocity is from above and below the plane. So that the current seat can form and then the particles can get, get accelerated. So in this process also, the, the dependence of energy gain by the particles can be of the order of uh, uh, reconnection velocity. And it depends on the first, first power of that velocity. So it is a first order like Fermi process. So this, can, this has been well uh, examined in uh, shown in simulations with where the current seat with turbulence have been studied. So in this scenario, there is a possibility of fast reconnection. Uh, so this was proposed by Lazarian and Wisniak in 99. And uh, there have been several simulations later on which showed the first order Fermi acceleration. And also it was found that this power is, the spectrum of the particles were found to be of some kind of power law in nature. And the dependence of this was something like the power law index of one or two. So another uh, w the kind of system we try to study is, uh, so suppose we have a accretion disk with field lines uh, uh, arising from this system and also the black hole. And there is a possibility that they, they can approach each other with opposite polarity. In this scenario, it is possible that uh, they, it, it, it uh, facilitates the possibility of reconnection. So the field lines can approach and in presence of turbulence, there can be several uh, reconnecting points which can effectively lead to a large current seat in this kind of system. And basically it can happen in the coronal region and mainly you can imagine something like in the sixth region around the jet. So we try to see how much power can be extracted from these kind of processes. So, uh, so it was shown that uh, considering different kind of accretion disk plus corona uh, setup or, or if, if we consider even a simple thick disk regime, we could get uh, comparable power and which were suff sufficient to explain the radio emission as well as gamma ray emission from uh, different kind of uh, stellar mass black holes as well as supermassive black holes, which were basically uh, non blazer type. The, because we were considering the base of the jet, which, were, which, was, which are supposed to be seen uh, during the observation in this kind of system. So it is possible to explain the, the emissions, uh, high energy emissions from the systems with this reconnection power. And another, another thing that we try to see is how this, there can be interplay between a, a black hole energy extraction and the reconnection power. So it is possible that uh, during a steady state, uh, th there is a continuous extraction of black hole spin or from the ergosphere. So, and then when there is a state transition like scenario, then there is a sudden uh, uh, event of reconnection, which can uh, lead to less efficient extraction of black hole spin and increase in reconnection power from this kind of system. And we, we found that there, these powers are quite comparable uh, in magnitude. Uh, while uh, bland, uh, this, this kind of blandford Zanajek mechanism which depend on the black hole rotation. Of course, it's likely to depend on the rotation of the black hole, but this, this, uh, the magnetic reconnection we, we take into account, basically the fast magnetic reconnection, do not depend on the black hole spin. So this, this, this was a possible explanation, uh, theoretical explanation for different resu results seen in GRMHD simulations of MAD regime by Dexter et al. or, or Parfrey et al. did some simulation which showed similar results. So another thing I want to emphasize is that there is a possibility of uh, 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 in initiating a, a reconnection when uh, there is some sort of instability in the system. For example, in case of jets, it is possible there is a, some kind of strong magnetic field, a strong toroidal magnetic field, wherein uh, a current driven kink mode uh, can kick in when, uh, when the jet is somehow perturbed and the jet tries to move away from the axis, the kink let it grow more. So in a way it can also lead to the, this can lead to the uh, distort, distortion of the system. However, also facilitate the magnetic reconnection because the field lines are likely to 
approach each other with uh, opposite polarity. So we found that the, uh, take into account different kinds of scenario of heavy jet and light jet, mainly we can think about maybe uh, Asian jet and the GRB jet. So in all those sorts of possible jet scenarios, we found that the jet, the kink instability is likely to grow and which also leads to increase in possibility of reconnection. So we found that the, in, in case of heavier jets, uh, the, the, the kink instability is likely to grow in the same place while in the lighter one, it is likely to propagate. And what was found is that there is some kind of uh, sites which, which shows the increase in curl of B, basically the rise in current density because the magnetic fields have gone on, undergone reconnection. So these sites are possibility, these sites are the uh, most uh, kink unstable sites and also the reconnection sites in this kind of jet system. And so here we can see the, the vertical slice of the uh, jet and where you can see here that uh, here is the magnetization and the, here is the color B. So the reason where the, there is a drop in magnetization, there is a, a bit sharp increase in the color B because the current density is generated. So when we try to study the reconnection rate, we, it was found in recently in our recent paper that the reconnection velocity is something of uh, order of some percentage of alpha in speed. That means it is really fast in, in, in the way it is needed to explain some observation. And also this, uh, this highest value of reconnection velocity is achieved when the kink stability attains its maximum amplitude in the system. Here is the magnetic energy density profile and the kinetic energy density profile, where, we, where, it is plot, where the plot shows the volume average kinetic energy uh, density versus the time. And here you can see there is a, initially there is some, some, uh, some kind of adjustment in the system and later on there is a rise in, in the kinetic energy. And here we see some sort of linear regime of uh, uh, the increase in kinetic energy in the system, while uh, the, the, there is a dissipation of uh, the magnetic energy. So in, uh, what was done in this recent work is that there was a snapshot taken of the King jet. And here what you can see, this is a uh, three-dimensional uh, volume averaged uh, uh, kinetic energy, sorry, uh, volume averaged histogram of position of uh, particles which have been accelerated. And here the squares shows those, uh, those particles which have been accelerated. And then here the circles show the part, position of the particles whose reconnection velocity was uh, higher than the average value. That means these are the possibly, these are poss possibly uh, the sites of uh, fast reconnection. And then also here the, the yellow, yellow uh, patch shows the the, the current density uh, sites in the, the, the increased current density locations in the King jet. So uh, here we try, what was done in this kind of simulation is that we try to take a snapshot of a King jet and the particles were injected in the systems, like something like a few thousands, some thousands of test particles. And it was seen that the, there is a jump in uh, this uh, energy of these particles. There are several orders of jump of this uh, in the energy of this injected particle. And here what you can see is the, uh, the color shows the, the, the component of velocities which were accelerated. So here you can see the parallel component of the velocity were uh, mainly accelerated in this kind of system. That means the, the particles were accelerated in parallel to the reconnecting layer. And it is for, this shows that, that there is a possibility of uh, the particle acceleration between the current seats. So it is, of course, the uh, reconnection driven, uh, reconnection uh, means the particles uh, accelerated by reconnection in this process. While in this region where the perpendicular velocity components were not so much accelerated, were mainly due to maybe a curvature of drift acceleration. These simulations were done for a magnetization parameter of order of one. And also, I would like to mention that um, the, there was a profile the, we tried to uh, uh, find what was the acceleration time dependence with the uh, energy, energy of the injected particles. And there, there was a weak power load dependence on the energy of the injected particle in this kind of system. While the spectrum uh, showed the uh, initially we have the Maxwellian uh, distribution spectrum, and later on, as the system evolved, 
it was found that there is some kind of power law uh, dependence on the energy. So, and this this was like a power law tail at the in the higher energy regime, and this is something similar to what is found in the the peak simulations and observations. So here is my summary that of possibly the reconnection is an important uh, feature in accretion jet systems and lead to dissipation of magnetic energy so that there can be conversion of regime from magnetically dominated flow to kinetically dominated flow. And of course, the, this, this kind of accelerations can explain the gamma ray emission in microclusters and non blazer regions. And, of course, and another issue is that there can be some sort of competition between the uh, black hole spin extract, extraction and the magnetic reconnection power so that there can be at some point there can be a steady jet another point there can be a, a non-steady jet and also in, in recent work we found that there is a, of course there is a possibility of driving these uh, particles to high energy regimes maybe even TeV regimes in these sorts of systems. Thank you, Chandra. Thank you also for being perfectly on time. So we have a question from Christoph. Uh, hi. So um, at, at, at the beginning, you, you mentioned that reconnection can be so fast uh, that uh, reconnection rate can be can be uh, almost equal to the Alvin velocity, yeah. Uh, which is, uh, yeah. However, uh, there is uh, st the standard result I know is that this is uh, this is roughly ten percent of of Alvin at most? Do you do you have some particular? Yeah. Scenario? So, so the 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 average uh, reconnection velocity that was found is something like five percent of Alvin velocity, but mm -hmm. there were some locations. Suppose in this uh, snapshot, you can see. Uh, so this is these colors represent something like. Uh, with respect to the Alvin speed, so it can it can reach up to even like ten percent of Alvin. Ten percent, yes, that I can agree yes. with ten percent. But but yeah, 10 percent. more than that, it will be. Uh, no, we, we, I just mean to say that okay, this would be something like, uh, uh, at least in order of like something like ten percent of Alvin speed. Mm -hmm. Thank you. At most. Yeah. There any any question? Any other question? Okay, the chat. No, no one okay. chat. Okay, so thank you, Chandra, and we can okay. move to the next talk. Um, so next talk is uh, from Benoit. Benoit Silti. Okay. Okay, can, can you hear me now? Yes. Great, okay. Okay, well, th thank you again for, for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, Jorge, and uh, thank you, Brian, uh, for having us, uh, me and, and Benjamin today for, for, for this uh, meeting. And uh, the point of this presentation is gonna be to, to draw uh, an overview of uh, why, do, why a kinetic approach uh, is interesting. Uh, in the context of, uh, of black hole magnetosphere in the context of M87 observations. And this talk should be really seen as the first part uh, of a second talk, which will be given by uh, Benjamin after, right after me. Okay, so what the, the work I'm gonna present has been done with uh, all of these colleagues uh, shown here in Grenoble, in the US and uh, in, uh, in Dublin. Uh, so what I, I we mostly focusing on is uh, what we call the magnetosphere of the black hole, which is the, the closest environment that is accessible to observations, uh, possibly observations, uh, which is this magnetized environment where we think there is active plasma going on near the magnetosphere. And we think this is relativistic in, in, uh, in many ways, not just the effect of GR, but also because we uh, expect very strong particle acceleration mechanisms to relativistic speeds, but also that you expect to have percolation happening. And I will show, and particularly Benjamin will show in the next talk, how important per production is in order to activate the, uh, the, the so-called Blanford's-Nike uh, mechanism. 
Um, and therefore, uh, for all of these reasons, this, this is great for, uh, for the topic of this meeting in general, uh, that uh, you can probe uh, GR in extreme conditions where you also mix uh, plasma physics and quantum electrodynamics uh, mechanisms. And because the problem involves so many different uh, physics, many uh, different regimes and rather extreme regimes, this is very difficult to solve. And therefore you need to have to use simulations. So basically the, the path I'm gonna to follow today is uh, what uh, Sam has drawn as the path number one, which is that we we'll begin with the model of the source and try to then extract observable. So this is the journey uh, we're gonna to try today. Uh, so as you know, the state of the art uh, for, for doing this, this path from, from the model of the source to observations is to use GR MHD simulations, uh, which uh, is developed since the early 2000, uh, which consists in modeling your plasma in the form of a magnetized fluid. Uh, with this, you can have, uh, you can capture the overall dynamic of the, of the, uh, of the flow on the, over long and large uh, temporal and spatial scales. So that's the, 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 the great and neat uh, aspect of this. And you can capture the overall electrodynamics uh, of the system. But as we've already uh, discussed today, uh, there are some uh, difficulties uh, with, with such approach. And in particular, the endodense region, which are shown on, on the right-hand side here, this very bluish region where you need to inject plasma by hand, as this region is highly magnetized and disconnected from the accretion flow. Um, you're also missing some of the non-ideal effects, uh, which are important for understanding particle acceleration. And therefore, if you want to uh, understand where not the non-thermal emission is being produced, like in the EHT, which is non-thermal in nature, you need to uh, to do assumptions if you want to connect to do this uh, path from the theoretical model of your of your object to observations. So the the other uh, approach that we are uh, currently working on is to try to to bridge this gap uh, by using kinetic simulations. And one of these uh, kinetic uh, approach is called the particle in cell approach that I will uh, detail in a, in a minute which basically consists in uh, saying that your plasma flow is not just uh, a continuous fluid, but it's actually composed of discrete uh, charges moving around. And this is particularly relevant for this very underdense region where we think the medium is basically collisionless. Um, and therefore, you have additional uh, plasma physics uh, mechanism happening that are difficult to capture or impossible to capture with MHD. Some of, some of these are of particle acceleration, recreation, and the emission of radiation. And therefore, there's hope that we can bridge this gap by producing synthetic observable directly from, from, from the simulation. Uh, but there are, of course, uh, drawbacks to this. And one of this is because the, the peak approach is uh, solving the, the kinetic scale. So what I mean by kinetic, by the way, is the scale at which you're looking at the Lamo radius of the, of the particles in this high field region, which means it's a tiny fraction of the size of the horizon of the black hole. Therefore, there's a, there's a big problem of scale separation uh, between the, the microscopic scale, black hole size, to the, the kinetic scale, microscopic scales, which we cannot fit in uh, current computers. Uh, so the peak approach uh, consists in uh, evolving a discrete uh, number of charged particles. So typically what I'm talking about here only are electron pos and positron pairs. You will see why in a minute. And uh, basically what you do is that you solve the Newton equation in, in the Kerr uh, metric in this con context. And then you compute the, the, electro the elect electric current uh, from the motion of individual particles onto a mesh on which you solve Max's equations such that you can have a self-consistent picture and evolution of fields and particles. And in this way, you can have a self-consistent uh, modeling of electrodynamics, particle acceleration, radiation. And in astrophysics, this approach has been extremely uh, fruitful in the last decade or so uh, for different applications, whether it's collision of shocks, reconnection, as we've seen in the previous talk, uh, turbulence, kinetic turbulence, uh, pulsar magnetosphere, and, and, and I think, I hope, black hole magnetosphere. 
Um, so the, the main idea of how the magnetosphere of a pulsar or a black hole works is uh, re related to the nuclear uh, inductor, which means that if you assume that your object, you assume that the perfectly conducting sphere is uh, spinning uh, in the presence of a magnetic field, what happens is that you're going to polarize your, your sphere and therefore you're going to build up the potential difference between your equatorial plane and the pole of your star. So um, if you then have a conducting medium, say plasma, in the case of an astrophysical environment, then you're going to have current uh, that are going to flow in, in, in your plasma. So what happens in the black hole? Well, in the black hole, you don't have a conductor. The black hole is not a good conductor. So where, where is it? Well, um, in fact, what plays the role effectively of, of this inductor is space-time itself, which uh, as frame dragging is uh, effectively um, act, um, making space-time as an active medium from an electromagnet electrodynamic point of view, such that uh, the, the dragging of field lines that are passing by uh, nearby the black hole are going to be um, uh, twisted and you're going to build up and uh, induce uh, an electric field. And in particular, an electric field, which is a component of the electric field, which is parallel to the magnetic field, meaning that this is prone and uh, good for particle acceleration. But where does the, the plasma come from? Because we need to have plasma in order to, for this thing to work, in order for this machine to work. And uh, you cannot rely, uh, we think, in, in this uh, magnetospheric uh, regime, from the accretion flow as you would need to cross field lines. And this would not be possible in a highly magnetized region as we, we think is happening. Therefore, what we think instead is happening is that you have percreations, that you have an in-situ um, generation of plasma that is able to load your field line with plasma. But in order to, for this mechanism to work, you need to sustain this mechanism for it to, to work. Um, and so one uh, general idea that you have this uh, kind of a soft radiation field around the accretion flow and uh, sorry, around the black hole, which could be provided by the accretion flow as an obvious source that could also provide the magnetic field. And uh, as the black hole spin, you are inducing a strong electric field, which if you just add just a seed particle that could produce um, uh, a pair in there, then you could uh, kind of spark an electromagnetic cascade of electron positron pairs and gamma rays that could effectively fill this region continuously. And this will be more discussed by Benjamin in the next talk. Now assume that you have plenty of plasma in there, you're gonna drive currents as we've seen. And in the case of what I've shown here schematically uh, with these vertical field lines, you're gonna drive this kind of uh, structure of currents that are gonna flow uh, at the separatrix uh, region for the written current and along the open field lines that are twisted uh, by uh, the rotation of, of space time in this region. Basically, all of the field line crossing the horizon of the black hole will be set into rotation and is going to transport uh, electromagnetic power uh, to infinity. And the other important features are actually very important for what, what's coming next is the equatorial current sheet where the current is closing in towards the horizon. Uh, so this jet is uh, extracting electromagnetic energy from the spin of the black holes. This is the so-called Blanford's night uh, mechanism that you recognize here, where the electromagnetic power scales as the, as the magnetic flux through uh, the horizon of the black hole times the spin square of the black hole. Um, an important aspect of this is that if you then inject plasma in there, you're going to have plasma flying to infinity and plasma flying back inside uh, the black hole due to the gravitational pull. And this means that you need to have somewhere a stagnation surface uh, in the jet. And this also will be uh, discussed further out in the next talk. Okay, so I'm going to jump right in into uh, what we see in simulations. Um, I'm, I'm going to discuss um, some of the few uh, cases that we start uh, at the beginning and Benjamin will continue with more elaborated simulations. So the first test we wanted to do was to test that our electromagnetic solver in the code works. And the, the, the only case that we have, which is analytic, is the, uh, is the, is the world uh, configuration where we can compute the flux uh, passing by the horizon, which decreases as 
uh, as the spin to the fourth uh, to the fourth power. Therefore, if you go to the extreme cases where the spin um, is uh, maximum, like I think it was 0.99 in this particular simulation, you can see that initially, if you if you thread the black hole with magnetic field, it's going to be expelled uh, as it should by by the black hole. So this is in vacuum. This is in vacuum. Um, but we think this is, as, as I've argued before, uh, we think this is not realistic for uh, understanding the activity of black holes. We need plasma. And when we add plasma, the picture change, changes dramatically. Uh, namely, the presence of currents is going to be uh, changing the whole picture. Let's see if I can change my slide. Well, I guess he wants me to finish the movie. All right. Let's see. Can I do that? Come on. <laughs> That's frustrating. Okay. No. Yes. Okay. Gotcha. Uh, all right. So the um, what we are most interested in is the regime at school for three, which means that it's a highly uh, super strong magnetic field, which is driving the entire dynamic of the flow, meaning that the only relevant force that you have, no gravity, no um, no pressure gradient, nothing. You just have the Lorentz force. And you have all of these other nice uh, properties that the electric field should be perpendicular to the, to the current and the same for uh, the magnetic field. And uh, so what we've been uh, trying, we say, okay, we, we're not going to do uh, any assumptions in where the photons are coming from, or where the pairs are coming from. We're going to begin with a simulation. We're just going to inject by hand, like sprinkle basically the, the simulation domain with electron positron pairs. And uh, by doing this, we basically uh, want to screen this parallel component to the, to the magnetic field. So we want to have D dot B, D being the magnetic field, the electric field measured by the FIDO. Um, uh, the parallel component should be zero as it should for force free configuration. So we've put like a, a basically a threshold, uh, meaning that we don't want this component to be too large. And if it does become larger than that, we just add uh, additional plasma. And so that's how it looks like um, when you inject, inject plasma volumetrically in the entire system. We begin with this wall configuration in vacuum, and then we start adding plasma to the system. And what you see is that uh, as simulation go, you see that instead of expelling the magnetic field lines away from the horizon, this is exactly the opposite is happening due to the, uh, to the uh, emergence of, of strong currents in the magnetosphere, poroidal currents flying along this jet region over here, you see electrons on the left, positron on the right. And this current sheet that I was talking about uh, before, which uh, we think is actually very important uh, for understanding M87 image. Uh, and I will come back to that in a as well. Uh, you, can, you can start to see the separatrix here, which separates the magnetic field lines that are in rotation, which are over here, from the static field lines, which are not connected that are not passing by the other sphere uh, of the system. So this is also a way actually to, to form kind of a brighter edge for, uh, for the base of the jet, as we were talking about before. And as you can see, the, um, the, 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 the current sheet becoming stable to uh, tearing modes. So we start forming uh, plasmoids, um, uh, which uh, in 3D will look like more like a, a flux, ro flux ropes uh, forming in the form of a disk around the, the black hole and confined close to the atmosphere, a little bit further out, but mostly in the atmosphere. Uh, this is how the magnetic field configuration looks like, in particular focus on the color, which shows you the amount of toroidal magnetic field, so the amount of winding of the field lines. So the, the bluer uh, the color, the, the more the wind is important. And we can we can also we've been able to confirm that uh, these field lines are indeed rotating at the expected rate of half of the horizon angular velocity. We can then compute the uh, amount of power, electromagnetic power being su supplied by the black hole to infinity, and this is consistent with the uh, the Planfels Nyack uh, kind of extraction in terms of point influx. Uh, we've also seen uh, a smaller fraction, uh, a smaller component from particle with negative energy and infinity uh, being swallowed by the black hole, which effectively also extracts energy uh, in, in the system. So an additional source, less important than electromagnetic, since this is mostly force free, but still we, we, can, we can see that. And they are, as you can see here, these are the bluish region where the 
the, the energy at infinity of the particle is essentially negative region of interest here. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, I, I don't have much more to say, but um, as far as particle acceleration concerned, that's, that's our main concern. This is what we, our main motivation even, is that reconnection, as we've seen in the previous talk, leads to non-thermal particle acceleration. And as you can see here, uh, this is where you find the highest Lorentz factor is mostly from the current sheet, a little bit from the separatrix here, uh, and a little bit from the polar caps. Um, so we identify at least two acceleration mechanisms, reconnection, as we would see in other astrophysical objects and also from, uh, from the uh, solar neighborhood, and also polar cap discharge due to percolation or along open fields. Okay, so I'm gonna show now a movie showing the uh, like a three D a three dimensional run of such a simulation, which shows that when you ignite pre-production, you start forming the structure of a jet, which you can see mostly here from this edge and view. Uh, you can see field lines in blue, but from this edge and view, you can see the formation of the jet. In particular, it's kind of hollow kind of structure of the jet, which is very bright due to the separate expansion. But mostly, what you see is this disk. You see, which is very turbulent. Uh, which are, uh, if you do a slice through this, you would see islands, but in three dimensional, due to the, you know, the shear um, of space time, you form this kind of flux rope, which are, becomes extremely turbulent. Uh, we're going to see a zoom in view afterwards, but you're going to see there's this kind of a sea of, uh, of this flux rope flying around, which is, um, yeah, you can see this zoom in view. You see this flux rope are kind of moving up and word. Uh, due to some kink instabilities, uh, it's kind of like a, lots of knots forming around. And this is kind of more a, view, uh, a viewing angle from M87 that I've tried to mimic here in this movie, uh, kind of a nearly face on view that we would see. And uh, as Benjamin will show in the, in the next talk, uh, yeah, okay, well, well, we'll see in the next talk here, we can, okay, I can switch to the other side. Uh, you, we're going to see some, uh, we can do some synthetic images of, um, of what the shadow, well, well, we'll see uh, some degrees, but with this ring of emission, at least with knots flying around, which is purely due to uh, the current sheet. Um, I'm, I'm switching to a different, uh, slightly different topic here to uh, advertise a work in progress uh, with Ila Kemela. Uh, uh, who is a postdoc here in, in Grenoble, uh, where he's looking at uh, the interaction between now a magnetosphere and a disk, which we assume here is a purely, uh, it's, it's, it just here has a boundary condition to, to hold the field in place, but also add some shear to, uh, to, the, to, the, to the field lines from the disk. And so what we see here in this kind of cano canonical kind of structure, we see this formation of plasmoids that is emerging from the system that can become very large up to microscopic scale in this, in this system, uh, which could potentially uh, be um, the, the state of the fraying state from uh, an accreting uh, black hole where you have a magnetosphere interacting with, uh, with the accretion. So we have a system of open field line, like Blanford's night type field lines with disk like uh, field lines over here and at the separatrix you form this chain of plasmoids that is reminiscent of, of reconnection. Okay, and I, I will stop here and I will uh, take questions if any, and otherwise I will leave the floor to uh, Benjamin. Thank you, thank you. Love this uh, very, very interesting talk. Um, you have two questions, oh, please. Uh, so we have Sam and then Christoph. Thanks. Uh, I was really interested to see the fairly high fraction of Penrose mechanism mm. yeah. particles. You know, in, in the old, you know, in the old days before I was around, certainly, you know, that there was excitement and then it was dismissed because somehow Hartle in an appendix, I don't remember, showed that it's just very unlikely for particles to collide and just the right way to launch one into the black hole with counter rotating right. momentum and so on. So do you have a mechanism? Is it some like spark gap that forms and likes to launch half its particles backwards or something or what's the what's the story yeah we, we think this is through the uh, through the Lorentz force that this thing is happening that this uh, non-ideal electric field somehow uh, managed to uh, to push some particle outwards um, there's a there's a paper by uh, so these aren't newly born particles you, you just sort of drop particles in 
So, right. So in this particular uh, simulation, we're dropping particles in uh, as, you, uh, as, as you have the system evolving. So you can have some particle being indeed pushed inward uh, towards the black hole while you have the other one, the other sign of charge potentially that is flying out. With the oh, oh, so it's from the potential energy associated with the electric field, probably that's not cool. really the Penrose. Okay. That's what we think is happening. Oh, okay. Okay. I think it's happening. Yes. Uh, there, is, there is a, a paper by, I think, uh, is this Carrasco? I forgot. Comiso? Co Comiso, yes, Comiso, yes, thank you. <laughs> From uh, Comiso, where they uh, investigated this in a semi-analytical way, where they tried to infer the, uh, the, the contribution from the Lorentz force uh, towards, the, uh, to, towards the extraction of energy from Penrose. So it's kind of a collisionless way of, uh, of Penrose mechanism. Yeah, I think if you did the same thing with a pulsar, you'd also get the same negative energy extraction just from the wrong sign in the potential energy term oh, electric field. I don't think it's the Penrose process, but we can talk more. Okay. <laughs> well, we, we coined this term just in terms of negative energy uh, particles. That, that was the, uh, the idea. But indeed, this is not the original Penrose mechanism. I agree. Yes, definitely it's not the original one. It's an electromagnetic one. Uh, so uh, next question is uh, Christoph. Christoph, please. Okay, so uh, very nice results, uh, Benoit. I want to ask you about the gamma rays. You think they could be produced from those uh, energetic particles in the polar cap region or rather the, uh, from, from the equatorial current layer? Hmm. So you, you have actually answered uh, in the next talk. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so there's going to be some uh, quantitative. Uh, yeah. So let's let's wait maybe. Yeah. Right. That's what I suggest. <laughs> okay. okay. There is a, another question. Uh, okay. yeah, I wrote it in the chat. I was wondering, uh, Benoit, was the three D like the the volume render you showed? Was it the three D GRPEX simulation you did? Yeah, yeah, sorry, I forgot to mention. Yeah, this is a simulation. Uh, this is not uh, an artistic view. <laughs> it's just 3D pixels. I mean, it's the first, it's the first 3D you, you did in, with GR, no? Yes. That's amazing, cool. amazing. Very nice. Thank you. <laughs> very, very nice. Congratulations. Really, really nice work. Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you, Benoit. So we can move to the next talk. Is Benjamin? Uh, yes, Benjamin, please. Yes. Uh, if you're ready. Sorry, I thought. Can you hear me right? Yes. Yeah. Okay, let me share my screen. Okay, is everything all right? Sure. All right. All right, so hello, everyone. Uh, thank you. I want to first let me thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to speak at this meeting. Uh, my name is Benjamin Clincan. I'm a third year PhD student at the University of Grenoble. And uh, this talk follows directly from the previous talk by Benoit Serruti, who has been supervising me during my whole PhD. So in this talk, I'm going to focus more on the, on the results that we obtained from the, from, from the black, black hole kinetic simulations the necessity and the usefulness of which he has explained during his talk. So first, let me just come back a little bit on the on, uh, motivations. So one of the first motivation, one of the main motivations for studying black hole magnetosphere is to understand how energy can be extracted from black holes and thereafter how this energy can be transferred and converted to the jet or to gamma ray flares. And so one of the main, the, the most promising ways to do so has been proposed uh, by Blanford and Snake. This is the Blanford Snake solution. And so this is the way to tap energy from a rotating black hole. Uh, so in this solution, one can launch an electromagnetically dominated outflow from the, from the closed magnetosphere, from the, uh, the vicinity of the black hole. But one of the main features from this solution is that it requires the magnetosphere to be force free, namely that uh, the there is plasma everywhere and in sufficient amounts so as to screen the parallel electric field in the whole magnetosphere. So this is a strong statement. And, uh, and uh, actually, the, the origin of this plasma, the, the source of plasma, this, the origin of the plasma is still quite unclear. Because uh, 
the dynamics of the magnetosphere, the magnetosphere are such that you need a continuous injection mechanism in the polar regions above and below the black hole in the, in the jet region. Because the, uh, far, far away from the black hole, there is an outflow, but clo close enough from the black hole, the, the gravitational, gravitational pull is too strong, and so the plasma gets swallowed. So there is a kind of separation surface, and you need plasma injection at this location. And it's quite unlikely that uh, the, the plasma could be provided by the accretion flow in these regions, because these regions are so highly magnetized, as was shown by GR MHD simulation. So instead, you need another mechanism and one plausible plasma source that could do the job is pair production by photon-photon annihilation. Because, because the, the black hole magnetosphere environment is right for this kind of process, because the whole magnetosphere is bathed into a soft background radiation field, which is emitted by the hot accretion flow. So one of the main components of the magnetosphere that we need to simulate in order to have realistic uh, plasma injection is spark gaps in the magnetosphere. So let me explain this more in more detail. So let us assume that there is a gap above the black hole, which, is, which means that there is an unscreened uh, parallel electric field, which is able to accelerate particles. Then you will have vacuum breakdown. That means that we accelerate particles, we have inverse Compton scattering, producing high energy photons, and then pair creation. So actually with pair creation, we screen the gap, the electric field, uh, the parallel electric field will drop, but then uh, the, the, this plasma will outflow or inflow, and then the gap will be restored. So, um, so through this mechanism, you will, through the, the, the presence of spark gaps, you will trigger electromagnetic cascades, which will then produce plasma in, into the magnetosphere. So what we wanted to do in order to understand how pla uh, the blunt force magnetic mechanism can be activated, how we could get actually a force free magnetosphere, was to add new modules to the, the general relativistic peak code Zeltron that Benoit has presented. So we, ha we have added modules for uh, pair creation by photon-photon annihilation and inverse Compton scattering. So these are treated self-consistently within the simulation. We also had added high energy photons as a, another species that we simulate into our peak code. And so we, in the next, we'll focus on the, the physics, uh, the, the simulations of these gaps. So we used a uh, quite simple numerical setup in order to focus on the, the mechanisms of these gaps. We had we are uh, we have performed 2D axisymmetric simulations, and we have used uh, an, a magnetic monopole configuration. So this was uh, uh, on the one hand a more simple configuration. So we would not have current sheets, as I, as I will explain uh, later on. And also, uh, a magnetic monopole configuration is quite realistic in the very close environment of black holes. You expect field lines to be bent and almost come out radially of the black hole. And so the whole simulation box is immersed into a uniform and monoenergetic background radiation field, which means uh, uh, more practically that the, me the propagating medium is opaque for, uh, for high energy photons by, because of pair creation and for charged particles because of inverse Compton scattering. So the main parameters that uh, determine the fate of our simulations are the following. We have uh, the opacity, tau naught, which is uh, proportional to the density of the background radiation field. We have the normalized energy of this background radiation field, uh, which, we, which we assume to be monoenergetic, energetic, and we have the magnitude of the magnetic field. And so, as Benoit mentioned, uh, uh, the, the particle in cell simulations suffer from one, uh, one shortcoming is that we have to simulate the resolve the microphysics case, so we cannot have a very realistic separation of scales. So in M87, these dimension, dimensionless parameters, B0 and epsilon not are quite, have quite extreme values that we cannot reproduce in our, in our setup. So what we wanted to do was to focus on this particular ordering, which is given by equation one, which means that uh, particles, charged particles, can be accelerated to such high energies, Lorentz factors, that they can, uh, they are above the pair creation threshold, and they can pair produce against uh, the soft uh, background radiation field, which has this given energy, this given energy epsilon naught. And so we have uh, we have fixed in the following these parameters: epsilon naught and b naught. Well, we will see the influence of tau naught shortly afterwards. So if we plot the, the average, uh, the sort of average uh, simulation with a high 
of tick of depth opacity. This is shown on the, on the plot on the left. We have a toroidal field which develops. We have the thin lines that are winding. We have an electric closed electric current system, which is able to extract the energy from the black hole. And as we can see from the plot uh, on the top and on, on the bottom right, which shows the angular velocity profile of the magnetic field lines, these actually are actually in solid rotation at the predicted angular velocity, one half of the black hole angular velocity. So all in all, we know that uh, we, when tau naught is high enough, uh, of the order of 30, we can reproduce a, a quasi-force-free magnetosphere. However, uh, what we are interested in is also deviations from force free. So let's like, take a look at the dynamics of the magnetosphere. So on the, in this movie, on the right, we have uh, plasma density and on the left, photon density. So you see that actually, actually the pair creation process is very extremely time dependent. Uh, you have patches of plasma which are ejected into the magnetosphere and these happen on a, a quite small scale. And it seems that the, this white uh, line, which denotes uh, a surface called the light, inner light surface, seems to be the separation surface from, from this flow. So what we realized uh, in the study was that uh, this inner light surface is actually the separation surface of the flow, and that this is where the gap opens. So the, the gap opens there, and then either flows inward or outward, and pair creation proceeds in these gaps. So we were able to pinpoint, uh, to pinpoint the location of these gaps. So this is shown on the space-time diagram on, on the left. The size of this gap is uh, microscopic. It's much larger than the skin depth, the plasma skin depth, although it's lower than RG. And so through this process, we are able to populate the whole magnetosphere with uh, electrons and positrons uh, in, uh, and produce a quasi-force-free magnetosphere. And we check that uh, this conclusion is uh, uh, is the same regardless of the spin. We also wanted to understand the, how, the, how the behavior of the simulations depending on the, the optical depth. So on this plot, you will, on the top panel, for example, you see how the, den the plasma density evolves uh, going from the right for, uh, from high optical depths to low optical depths on the left. And you can see that there's a quite drastic change. On the right, you have this time-dependent behavior and uh, variable, uh, variable feature that I've shown before. Whereas on the left, you will have at large distance uh, higher densities and uh, a smoother profile, whereas uh, close to the black hole, there seems to be a gap in density. So what happens actually is that at low opacity, uh, the, the interaction probability is is, uh, is lower. So particles are first able to accelerate to higher Lorentz factors. And then they enter the Klein-Nishina regime. And in, the, in this regime, the interaction, the, the, the cross-section for inverse Compton scattering drops even more. So that means that pair creation will actually, uh, pair creation will actually happen further from the acceleration, acceleration sites. And so that it will kind of decouple the acceleration and the, and, um, the pair creation so we will reach high densities and a low variability profile away from the uh, away from the black hole. On the other hand, at high opacity, um, the acceleration and creation operate in the same location as the same location. So this kind of gives rise to some kind of self-regulation, and this is why these high high tau naught simulations are also time dependent. On the left, you have, for example, a plot of the angular velocity of the field lines. And you can see that it's no longer in solid rotation at all. Some field lines are not, no, almost no longer rotating with the black hole. And finally, in this study, we looked at the energetics of the simulations, and we confirmed that we were able to produce a, a blankos nayek power. And we also realized that some energy was dissipated in the, into these gaps. However, at, the, at this time, we were not able to trace this energy and see where it was going. So this, is, this was the subject of the following study. So another main feature, as Benoit explained, of black hole magnetospheres is current sheets. So let's assume that there's a magnetic field line that goes around the black hole like this. This is in vacuum. This is the Meissner effect that he explained. But then if there is plasma motion, these field lines will be dragged towards the the black hole. And if, the, if we go up to the end of this process, 
will have two opposing magnetic polarities facing each other and being pushed towards each other. So this will create a current sheet, which will be prone to a tearing instability, and there will be magnetic reconnection. And so through magnetic reconnection, we will have particle acceleration and, and high energy radiation. And so we want to include this in order to understand how black hole magnetospheres uh, look like and what are their radiative contributions. So what we wanted to do next was to simulate magnetospheres, magnetospheres with both gaps and current sheets. So this is uh, on the left. This is a uh, this is a time average structure of this of such kind of magnetosphere. Again, you have the toroidal magnetic field on the right and the current density on the left. So you have negative currents flowing on both uh, polar caps, but then a positive current closing the current system on the separatrix and in the current sheet. And again, the, the dynamics are quite interesting. Again, you have plasma density on the right and photon density on the left. So you see that the polar caps are quite uh, active and uh, populate the magnetosphere with, with pair plasma due to these gaps. But the current sheet itself is quite dynamic. You have um, a cyclic accretion of plasmoids. What uh, this this pro this cyclic process is actually due to a competition between magnetic reconnection, which tends to pull field lines away from the black hole, and uh, the gravitational pull of the black hole, which uh, which brings which uh, pulls towards it plasmoids that are forming at the white point. And so the main result of this is that both the magnetic flux. Uh, through the black hole and the total electromagnetic luminosity show, uh, show stark bursts uh, and spikes. And so one might, might expect that uh, this uh, time-dependent luminosity will give rise to flares and many observable features. So the final part of this talk will be dedicated to the link between these kinds of simulations and observables. So in order to produce ob synthetic observables, and uh, link uh, simulations with observations, we need to trace the light from, emitted from the simulation. So first, we need to keep track of uh, in, uh, gamma ray photons, which are represented by inverse Compton photons. We can also include synchrotron photons in our simulations, since we know the local magnetic field. And finally, we have to couple uh, our simulations to uh, the GR ray tracing code. So and using this procedure, we can both reconstruct gamma ray light curves or millimeter images, which can be directly compared to the EHT observations. So I will try to speed up a little bit, but we performed this procedure for gamma ray light curves. So focus on uh, the blue and red uh, light curves, which are for these uh, disk, sim uh, disk uh, paraboloid simulations. The main lesson that we learned from this is that the emission from the current sheet, although this current sheet is very dynamic, is completely smoothed out. And this is uh, completely uh, due, to the, due to the many geodesics, which are quite complex and not straight at all re relating the current sheet to the external observer. On the other hand, uh, uh, light curves at uh, low viewing angle, when you look, fa uh, when you look at the magnetosphere face on, you trace the polar cap activity, which is uh, which imprints the gap activity, and so since the geodesics relating the polar cap and the observer are straighter, you will see more viability. It will, uh, there's no decoherence you know, if, you, if you if you like it. And another lesson is that these current sheets are extremely efficient at converting uh, electromagnetic energy into observable radi radiation, high energy radiations. We observed that the the radiative efficiency could be as high as forty percent. On the other hand, we found that using this setup only, we were not able to reproduce the stark uh, features of gamma ray flares, which are which can uh, rise by an, an order of magnitude during several uh, RG over C. We were not able to uh, produce to reproduce such flares, which, meaning that uh, these flares might be due to a change of external parameters, and this would be left to another study. And finally, as I said, we were able to synthesize images. So this is for various uh, viewing angles. And so as you see, there are several, uh, you can uh, see several features. And in, in order to interpret these images, we decomposed and we discriminated uh, the images depending on the emission sites of photons. So if photons originate from current sheet, you will see these rings. 
So this, this is basically, this is mainly on the right. You can see the, the emission, the, the, the main location where these photons are coming from. And on the other hand, if you want to trace the photons emitted from the photo caps, you will see these kind of hotspots, which are uh, either direct or the lens limit or the either coming directly towards us or after around, one way around the black hole. And so this is quite interesting in order to understand BHT observations, especially as we realize that if we include synchrotron cooling, the, the relative contribution of the polar cap was way below the contribution from the current sheet. And so that would mean that we might be able to reproduce, uh, to model the EHT images using the sole uh, emission from the current sheet. So in any case, we now know for, from uh, GRMHD simulations that current sheets are ubiquitous into in back order creating systems. And I'm sure that Bart in the next talk will be talking about that. And so we have we wanted to model EHT images using the, the emission from the current sheet. So we see a time average image uh, in the middle. And we also uh, reconstructed 3D uh, images in the 3D simulation that Benoit showed you before. So the variation on this video is, uh, is the, the face of the observer. So you have basically the observer uh, rotating around the black hole. And you can see that there are some kinds of hotspots uh, flowing around the ring. So this is the clear signature of the plas uh, plasmoids, which are emitting synchrotron radiation. And so this might be, uh, this might explain why there are hotspots in the, the images from the EHT. So I'm thinking I'm over time. So I just leave you with my concluding slides, except that my presentation just froze, but right in time. <laughs> thank you for your attention. Okay. Thank, thank you. you thank attention. you. Thank you, Benjamin. Uh, yes, maybe we have time for one question. Oh, <laughs> three questions. Okay, let's, let's see. Um, who was first? I, I don't know if there was everything on time. Let's, let's... Christoph was first. Christoph. Um, okay, thank you. Um, so I want to ask you about the photons that produce uh, the gamma ray signal in, in the polar cap region. My worry is that most of that gamma rays would fall on the black hole. And, and then, but you say that the output is about 40%. So in, in the total, total energy budget, the main contribution was not from the polar cap, actually. The, the, the current sheet was mainly contributing to the total radiative efficiency. However, the polar cap was more variable. But I mean, even if you are at a uh, high altitude uh, observing from... So, uh, yeah, so you're right. At very low uh, viewing angle, like really mm -hmm. face on, the, the contribution was quite small. Maybe the strongest contribution from the photo cap was maybe at 20, 20 degrees, uh, 40 degrees. Okay. But they were, they, there's a clear, uh, there, there's an outflow. So, and these photons are flowing out. Like, there's no doubt about this. Um, but the plasma there is uh, in flow, right? They, they, where but there, there's, an, there's an outflow. There's an output in the polar cap regions also. So this is above the stagnation surface that you. Yeah, so, yeah, okay. exactly. So in in our, in our simulations, the stagnation surface is the inner light surface, and it's quite close to the, the it's within the ergosphere actually. Within the ergosphere, yeah. Okay, thanks. Thank you. It's unlike, this is unlike GRMHD simulations. That's true. Sam, quick, quick question. Yeah, I'll just make it really quick and say that was so interesting. I have about 20 minutes of questions for you. Um, maybe I could convince you to, to have a Zoom with my group sometime and just go over some of this because yeah, it's super be interesting, better. totally relevant. I, um, maybe I'll send you an email. Okay, well, we can talk about that later, but I would, I'd be very happy to chat with you. Great. Right, thank you. <laughs> okay, I just said exactly the same to, to Benoit before. Uh, I, uh, I was disturbing him with some chat messages. <laughs> okay, oh, very, very nice. Oh, good. So we can move to the next talk. Yeah, thank you. Actually, last speaker is uh, Bart. Um, okay, I see you. Uh, you're very comfortable. <laughs> I'm still at home. Uh, yeah, I'm not in my office. So uh, yeah, I'm sitting on the couch because my wife is working on our uh, desk. Um, so yeah, 
That's perfectly okay. <laughs> so you start whenever you, you like. Thanks. Uh, thanks very much. <clears throat> yeah, I think uh, my talk actually uh, perfectly aligns with what uh, Benjamin and Benoit showed. So, so thanks a lot for their great talks and also for um, explaining many things that I don't have time to, to explain. Um, so I will show you actually, uh, I mean, mainly MHD simulations, um, but the, the results are surprisingly uh, similar to, uh, to, to Benjamin's results within the limit of what MHD can describe as they, they nicely explained. Um, here we go. Uh, I will give you some motivation, but I think we can quickly go over it uh, as, it's, as it has mainly been covered. Um, the EHT saw the accretion disk of M87 uh, and, and captures the accreting plasma. There are strong gravitational electromagnetic fields. So you need a general relativistic description um, and the EHT typically uses magnetohydrodynamics uh, for that, as you can see here on the left. However, the macroscopic size of this, let's say, system is about 10 to the 8 kilometers, and the microscopic size of, of the electron gyration is about a kilometer. So, uh, and additionally, the mean free path uh, of an electron is much larger than the system size, size like 10 to the 8 Schwarzschild radii. So this makes this plasma collisionless, or nearly collisionless at least, and, and it means that non-thermal effects are important. Um, MHD treats the plasma as a fluid, which is by definition like, like not collisionless. It's, it's, it assumes a thermal equilibrium between electrons and ions. So it means that electron dynamics and temperature mainly are completely unknown. And so this gives you the main uncertainty in interpreting the radiation. I'm not even talking about GR effects. Like if we assume the Kerr metric, um, then this gives you the main uncertainty in interpreting the radiation. And it, it just tells you that MHD models are insufficient to understand the EHT results. Um, then additionally, the EHT had uh, polarization images coming out recently, and, uh, and it, it, that can tell us something about uh, the structure of the typical magnetic field. Um, and the question is usually whether the field is weak and turbulent or like sane, as we call it, or it's actually strong and coherent or, or mad, so to say. And on the left, you see um, what those different fields uh, would show in the polarization image. Um, and it turns out that, uh, that we observe mainly uh, this kind of polarization. You can also see it here in, in the actual image, uh, which says that the field is mainly vertical. And Ramesh Narayan um, said that a black hole accretion disk could, in this, it could be in this magnetically arrested state where the field is mainly vertical. However, the field lines here are um, diverging in the jet. So, so I, maybe this is not completely the right picture that Ramesh uh, gave. But later, uh, Sasha Chekovskoy did um, the first uh, 3D uh, simulations in this regime, and it shows this image indeed of, of a jet that, uh, that goes here uh, vertically in like a parabolic shape. And like here in the disk, you see vertical field piling up. Um, and this uh, arrests the accretion flow so that, um, so that it's halted at some point. Um, we did uh, 2D GRMHD simulations with uh, resistivity and um, like we resolved the resistivity on the grid. So we have very high resolutions. And there you actually see that if you zoom into the, into the horizon, uh, you see that there is a current sheet forming here actually in between the disk and the, and the horizon um, that separates like, a, like the, the highly magnetized region from the from the lower magnetized disk region. This current sheet becomes plasmoid unstable and some plasmoids can fall into the black hole, some can escape and interact with the disk and heat up the disk. So this looks a lot like a Benjamin's um, a GR PIC model actually. Um, now, why, why is this relevant uh, even beyond what the EHT observes? Uh, for example, from M87, we've seen um, flares in the TEV range, so gamma ray flares in, uh, in, in 2005, eight and 10. And most recently there was a telegram announcement of another TV flare in this year. And those flares were observed together with a radio flux from the nucleus. So the idea is that the emission really originate, originates from uh, close to the horizon. And they had a variability time scale of, of a few days, which means that the emission region has to be of the order of a Schwarzschild radius due to causality restrictions. And we know that magnetic reconnection can accelerate particles and power such flares, uh, for example, from, from solar physics. So the question is, does this happen close to the horizon? And, and we've already seen the answer. The answer is yes. Um, now the question is, how can we model these reconnection physics, which we know are occurring in a collisionless plasma? How can we model them in MHD so that we can do global 3D simulations, take the whole accretion into account that a particle and cell simulation cannot yet, although 
I think it will be possible very soon. Um, so if you model a current sheet in a, in a, in a simple box, like the, the main aspect is that a horizontal field like goes together in an X point and then it has an outflow in, in, the, in the horizontal direction the, in the Wikipedia cartoon. Uh, here, I, I turned it by 90 degrees. And you see that uh, this MHD simulation looks very similar to typical PIC simulations. Like there are plasmoids forming, there's a hierarchy of scales, uh, there are secondary current sheets here due to merging plasmoids. So we can capture the global behavior. Um, however, there are some things that are different and I'll, I'll get back to it later. Um, those plasmoids, uh, they, can, they can power flares. They, they contain uh, many uh, non-thermal particles that pile up in them. Um, and to get those plasmoids in MHD, you need a Lundquist number that's typically very high. And there is a, an analytic limit uh, that says that this Lundquist number, which is one over the resistivity practically for, for our regimes where the alpha speed is speed of light, um, that resistivity has to be very small and that can either be numerical or explicit resistivity, but it mainly tells you that your resolution has to be high enough to resolve that resistivity uh, and the small spatial scales um, uh, 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 along with it. Um, so that requires extreme resolution. And that's why we carried out the largest uh, GRMHD simulation uh, ever done. Um, and here you can see the typical aspects of the simulation. You see the turbulent accretion disk here. You see the jet in the vertical um, uh, escaping. And then if we zoom in, we actually see that also in 3D, such a current sheet actually forms at the horizon. Um, and, uh, and, and this can hopefully explain the, the mechanism that powers these, these flares that we've seen both from M87 and also from Sagittarius A-star. Um, and I want to say that this, this current sheet, it forms only transiently. So it's not there all the time. Uh, most of the time, actually, um, the black hole is, is just in this standard mad accretion state where you have some broader, uh, slightly turbulent inflow. But uh, once every, uh, like, say, 1,000 RG over C, like, all the magnetic flux that piles up here at the horizon, it sort of ejects the disk, um, the accretion halts, at least over a fraction of, of, of the, as a mutual angle, and it forms this current sheet. And here you actually see that, um, that there are plasmoids here, also in 3D. So these are, as Benoit said, like these are like flux tubes um, in, in the out of plane direction. Um, and, and those plasmoids actually can sort of escape and merge into a larger structure. Here you see one that's about the order of one RG that uh, aligns very well with the hotspot that was observed by the gravity interferometer. Um, but for M87 particularly, this is interesting because this, this happens um, once every two years if you calculate the physical time. And it means that EHT might actually observe M87 if it's lucky um, in such a flaring state. And the question is like, what, is, uh, what does it look like? Actually, this current sheet is very hot. Um, there is pair production, uh, there is particle acceleration, all the kind of effects that you don't have in MHD. Um, what will be the effect of the image, um, as, as Benjamin has, has explained to us? Um, I, want to, I want to emphasize again that resolving these plasmoids in MHD, it really requires resolution of, of about 5,000 by 2,500 by 2,500, and that's a thousand times larger than EHD simulations. So EHD simulations cannot resolve uh, these phenomena. And, and you can also not do many of these simulations. It costs us more than a million GPU hours on summit. So you can maybe do one, one of these per year. Um, this was really only possible with the GPU acceleration in the hammer code that was developed by, uh, by Matthew Liska. So what does this look like actually in full 3D? Um, here you, in the bottom, you see the standard state where uh, blue and green field lines are both uh, in the disk and they, um, they accrete onto the, onto the black hole, they bring flux onto the black hole. And you see the, the volume render here is the temperature and all temperatures are below one. And temperature here is pressure over density. So a temperature above one means it's relativistic and below one uh, it means it's non relative In the flaring state here in the top, you actually see that uh, the blue field lines from the disk, they're sort of disconnected um, and they're nicely ordered, uh, except for some field lines that are still uh, accreting here over a very small azimuthal angle. And over the rest of the azimuthal angle, you see the green field lines that are in the current sheet and the current sheet is relativistically hot. Uh, all the temperature here is above one. Um, and the current sheet sort of spirals out. Um, and if you then zoom into the current sheet on the right here, you see that, for example, here in green, you have escaping flux tubes. And here on the left in, in magenta, you have uh, infalling flux tubes. So here, reconnection occurred that cut the field lines, that cut the horizontal field lines and created this vertical 
vertical field here and the green that can uh, that can escape. So reconnection is needed here to cut off these field lines and to make the flux uh, escape. A second aspect that you see is that these little uh, wiggles here, these are these little flux tubes uh, that we talked about before, and these are our plasmoids. So also in 3D, you see that, that you have these 3D uh, like um, plasmoids or flux tubes. Um, so to zoom into this uh, particular flaring state uh, from, from the two uh, views that we have, so left is the poloidal plane and the right is the toroidal plane, um, you see that this current sheet really becomes hot um, and the temperature here actually goes proportional to sigma. So sigma is the magnetization in the jet and that is um, set by a floor, uh, as uh, I think Benjamin explained, like in MHD, we need uh, density floors uh, that avoid that the simulation explodes because MHD cannot handle Magnetization is much larger than 100, um, just numerically speaking, cannot handle it. So the, um, the highly magnetized uh, plasma can flow into the current sheet due to E cross B. And here in the current sheet, the magnetic field goes to zero. This is non -gu no guide field reconnection. And, and like the, the matter in the current sheet that heats up is in principle coming from this high sigma region. So we really have high sigma, uh, no guide field reconnection here. And here again, you see the spiral structure and the gap here is not really, a this whole spiral is one current sheet and the gap here is only because the current sheet is so thin and then the gap, it actually moved out of the toroidal plane. Uh, as you can, can see here, for example, on the left, it's slightly out of the toroidal plane. So this whole region here is a current sheet and you also can see escaping and, and, and infalling flux tubes here and reconnection occurring. Um, so as I said before, like, like the, 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 the time of such a, as I call it, flaring state is about 100 RG over C. Uh, and it happens every 1500 to 2000 RG over C. So that's a few per day for Sagittarius. And it means um, uh, one, uh, like one or two, uh, one flare per two years uh, for M87. Um, however, to really get into observations, we really need the, the, the electron temperature, the composition of the plasma, the actual magnetization and not like our floored magnetization. And, we also know that in collisionless plasma, the reconnection rate is faster, uh, approximately 10 times. So we really need particle and cell to, um, to, to probe this uh, further. Um, this reconnection rate, I will show you what kind of an effect it has. Here you see the same video as I showed you before. And on the left, we zoom in to, to really the inner 10 RG. And in the bottom, you see the flux here um, uh, accumulating. So this is the magnetic flux on the horizon. And here it reaches a maximum. And at the point that the current sheet forms, um, the, the flux quickly uh, decays. Um, so all the flux is expelled through magnetic reconnection um, here at the horizon through this current sheet. And the rate at which the flux decays is governed by the reconnection rate. Um, and in these simulations, it goes about, about um, the, 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 the flux drop goes as the exponent of minus T over some time scale. And that time scale in MHD is 500. Um, I will get back to that later. Um, here, I, I show you that this is really reconnection. I show you the, the three components of the magnetic field. So red is the toroidal uh, field and magenta is the, 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 the horizontal. Um, so both components uh, reconnect, they both go through zero and the guide field here is really zero as you can see with the blue line. And here you can see this reconnection rate. Uh, so you can you have to take a difference between the left and the right because there is some global flow um, in the vertical direction. Um, and if you do that properly, you will see that the reconnection rate here is 0 0.01 times the alkane speed, which is the speed of light. So it, it all aligns with local box simulations in, in resistive energy. Now, to make a little sidestep, um, can, can this phenomenon also explain the flares from Sagittarius A star? It's, it's a very different system. We don't have a strong, jet, or at least we don't know what's going on with the jet. Uh, pair, pair production might be very different, but do we see these kind of hot spots as the outflows from the, the current sheet as we saw in the 2D simulation? Um, and we know from gravity that they observed uh, like flaring in the infrared X-ray about every six to 24 hours. So that, that sort of matches our uh, time scales. Um, and also for Sagittarius, there is a huge difference in, in electron gyro radius and the, the typical emission region. So we have, we have all the same problems as for M87. There's a, a huge a scale separation, but the question is in the electrodynamics that is reasonably well captured in MHD, can we see uh, this hotspot from it um, in 3D? Uh, so here you see again the video, uh, th this is the temperature again, uh, the, the dimensionless temperature. So everything above one is relativistic. 
here you see the flare. So the flare heats up the current sheet, the current sheet exhaust goes into the jet um, and, and uh, goes up and down along the jet boundary. But here you see actually the, the exhaust of the current sheet. And I, I will put a box just to make it clear. So the current sheet was hot, it did its reconnection and all the exhaust, so all these plasmoids that formed the vertical field that I uh, explained earlier on, the vertical field sort of piles up uh, here in one large flux tube that, that is sort of uh, spiraling around. And here on from in the toroidal plane, you see the same flux tube here as a hotspot that is in orbit. Uh, and this hotspot can orbit for about one orbital time before it uh, breaks up due to instabilities and before it diffuses out. Uh, so, so we think this is exactly what happens in Sagittarius. There is this like flux tube of vertical field that can, can orbit and uh, that we observe. Now, now comes the, the main caveat of our simulations as we, uh, we really need like a collisionless description of this plasma. So what we did is we modeled the current sheet at the black hole in resistive GRMHD. And you see that the typical thing happens inside the ergosphere, plasmids fall in. Outside the ergosphere, plasmids can escape mainly. Um, the reconnection rate here is also 0 0.01. Uh, this is very well resolved with 6,000 by 3,000 cells. We use mesh refinement here to make sure that we really zoom into the current sheet. But we still know that the collision with reconnection is about 10 times faster. So larger hotspots can grow in a shorter time, and this will affect your flare duration. And you can see here, this was a GRPIC simulation with the same code that Benoit and Benjamin uh, described. Um, and you see that indeed the plasmoid here uh, is, is the size of one RG, whereas the plasmoids here are more like 0 0.1 the size uh, of, of, of an RG. Um, and additionally, PIC evolves the particle distribution function. So we have first principles info on the dynamics and the temperature uh, of the particles. Now, what we can do is like, we can make a calibrated resistivity extracted from, from a particle and cell through Ohm's law, and we can plug it into MHD to capture the same behavior. And then we can maybe do 3D uh, simulations with accretion. And we did a little example of that here. This is the same setup where we just model the current sheet at horizon uh, with a resistivity. And, and that, that made it possible to do 3D uh, MHD simulation. This is uh, 3000 squared. So it's also very well resolved um, with mesh refinement. And also here you see that this current sheet is spiraling uh, due to the black hole spin. And you see the same thing as I showed you before. You see these X points here where the field line reconnected very clearly and you see multiple of, of those in the, in the plot. And you see these helical uh, little flux tubes, which are which are plasma. So globally speaking, MHD can capture the same thing, but the reconnection rate is, is off and we're missing a lot of information. Um, and to show you this particular uh, reconnection rate issue, um, uh, if you take, uh, if you do a sweet Parker analysis, I will not go into detail, but if you take a locally flat spray, uh, uh, frame and you do a, a typical analysis of the reconnection rate, you actually see that in MHD here it's 0 0.01 and in PIC it's 0 0.1. So there is really like a factor 10 difference um, that can affect your flare in time. Um, what's however very interesting is if you measure the flux decay here for our toy model, um, so it's completely independent of this accretion disk simulation. There is no disk, there's just a current sheet at the horizon. You see that the time scale of the flux decay here through reconnection is the same exponent of minus T over 500. Um, so, so independently, this MHD, this resolved MHD simulation gives you the same flux decay. So this tells you that it has to be reconnection that does this. It has to be the same process because here there is no really Taylor instability or accretion or whatever. It has to be the reconnection that, that does the flux decay. And if you then measure the same in the GRPIC simulation, you see that it, it goes with E uh, to the minus T over 150. So it's indeed a factor few faster. And this is exactly the difference in the reconnection rate. Um, uh, that, that gives you this faster uh, flux decay. So if we can capture this flux decay with a non-uniform resistivity in an MHD simulation, we might be able to get uh, at least a flare timing correct in a global simulation without having to do the very expensive 3D GRPIC simulations. Um, and, and in this way, um, we're trying to bridge the gap between the first principles and fully realistic PIC models uh, to MHD models that capture, can capture more of the global dynamics. Um, but are in the wrong regime of collisionality. Um, that was all I had to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Bart, for this uh, excellent summary of your recent work. Um, Benoit, please. Yeah, thanks, Bart. Very interesting. 
uh, I, had, I had also lots of questions uh, and we'll talk in the future, I'm sure. <laughs> but anyway, we ask you a couple of questions now. Um, I, I, was, I was curious about um, these uh, cycles that you, you mentioned, like what, what do you think drives this duty cycle for these uh, large scale uh, Great question. players? Great question. Um, let me see if I can quickly go back to them. Um, so what we think is, or what's a global uh, idea is that um, uh, it's a really tailor that drives the accretion. So in 2D, imagine if this, um, if this current sheet forms, accretion is fully halted because like everything has to go over one like an in integer uh, phi angle. So if there is a current sheet, there is no accretion. But here over the whole spiral, the, the accretion can sort of go in the third direction and go over a smaller fraction of that phi angle. And we think that in the standard accretion, like let's say in this, in this uh, region here where you're in a quasi steady state of, of flux on the horizon, you have many Rayleigh Taylor modes that are accreting onto the black hole um, that drive the turbulence. So it's not MRI, it's Rayleigh Taylor. But then at some point, this Rayleigh Taylor um, uh, goes into a single spiral mode, like a high, like a, an MS1 uh, mode, and it sort of quenches the accretion and forms this current sheet. Why it goes into this MS1 as a mutual mode, uh, we, we don't know yet. We don't know yet. We're trying to figure it out at the moment. Okay, so uh, what about the magnetic field? Is this like being transported in the same way uh, with the same cycle? Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. It's, this is this is the magnetic flux actually, but the mass accretion uh, looks the same. And um, so if you plot uh, the mass accretion rate here, it goes, it also drops and uh, you can see it actually here because like, you know, there is no mass accretion here. So it, it, it drops, but it drops a bit more sharply. So, um, my feeling is that the mass accretion goes first uh, and then the magnetic flux uh, follows. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it needs a bit more analysis. Okay. Uh, if, if I may ask a second question, uh, Jorge? Yes, yes, if quick, yes. Uh, yeah, it's, it's rather quick. I'm just curious a bit because my, my understanding that resolution is key uh, for, for these GRMHD simulations. So uh, what, what happens if you, if you lower the resolution? The, the, the dynamic changes dramatically. Uh, my understanding that you have no current sheets, but like is the overall dynamic changing very much? Yeah, great question. Obviously we looked into that because we had the same question. Um, surprisingly, no, like the flux drops are very similar. Um, the flux drops go faster because the reconnection rate is higher. Um, so the flux drops a bit faster, but it's not dramatic. Um, and that's probably because if you have a radial grid, like where all of this is happening, is actually the best possibly resolved with your radio, radial grid because cells get smaller with R. But in principle, um, the global dynamics are fairly similar. The main thing that doesn't happen is this thin current sheet. Like you, you get this ejection of the disk, but it's practically over a whole wedge here uh, that you get like we wouldn't even call it a current sheet. It, it's, it's, a, it's a broad diffusion layer, let's say, right. that gets uh, equally hot, but there are no plasmoids. And there's, I mean, you might call it reconnection, but I think we would call it diffusion uh, right. rather than yeah. reconnection. Yeah, I see. Thank you. Okay, good. Good, so I would like, um, I think we can, we can close the session, but I would like to thank all the speakers Oh, Brian, if you would like to say something. Uh, well, I just want, I want to thank everyone too. This uh, was a great selection of scientists here. I just want to add one thing to help toot uh, Bart's horn <laughs> on the, at the end there. Uh, one of, because this is about M87, and one of the things about M87 is the, the jet has lasted so long. I mean, it's, the jets in these radial loud quasars and M87, they last for millions of years. And these models just bring in the same direction of flux over and over again. They have an endless supply of magnetic flux, but uh, like the MAD models. And radio quiet quasars are just as old. And for some reason, they don't have this endless supply of magnetic flux. So why? Is there this huge volume of magnetic flux that just surrounds the, the radio loud sources? It's really hard. It could last for millions of years. It's hard to believe. But one thing with the reconnection process, global reconnection, the magnetic flux can 
will, will fly away at the alphane speed and get reabsorbed by diffusion into the disk and it keep recycling. I could see a, a possible state based on this where there's a, 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 a small region of the, a relatively small region of the accretion flow that just keeps recycling the same flux for eons. Just wanted to add that because uh, I can't keep my mouth shut, but it, this, there's so many experts here, it was great. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Thanks for organizing this session. Well. Thanks, you. Thanks to all of you. And let's keep in touch. Thank you, everyone. See you, see you around. Thanks, guys. everyone. See bye. you. See you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye. bye bye. Thank you, Brian. Bye bye. Thanks, all right. So, so Jorge, I want to thank you for running this. <laughs> Don't worry, it's my pleasure. It was a, it's a very, very, very nice session. It was uh, mainly for you. It was made for you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Some thank of the you. stuff relates to what you are doing. So thank you for the yeah, for yeah, organizing yeah. this this beautiful session. And the second part was more interesting for me, uh, but also the first half. So. Um, I think uh, I I will I I, I wrote some uh, um, uh, some messages to Benoit Ceruti. Um, yeah. So we will meet tomorrow afternoon, actually, to speak a little bit more about about their work and, and our work. So, so you really want? I was trying to push them. They they fit it in a little bit. Their lowest density. They their lowest density work right. You and Remo are in the very low density regime. Exactly, exactly. And I just they didn't. Uh, they didn't want to go that route that much. They want to show their new stuff. But I had them put in. They snuck in their two figures in Benjamin's uh, a presentation that were they had these different optical depth values. They had 30, 20, and ten. I had them put in the five. The the figures he's got on the the rotation rates decays at the at the pole and the the pointing flux disapp starts disappearing near the pole and comes out more towards the side so they can actually it requires a bigger simulation field but as the as this pair creation goes down the dynamics change a lot yes I thought I'd be more interested in that part uh -huh. okay so i i just don't i'm not downloading the papers now three four of their papers i had to read them um, before before um, speaking speaking with yeah. you, <laughs> so I have to read the, to, to read the papers in less than than in a half a day. <laughs> okay, well, good luck. Okay. Like good, good, Brian. So uh, thank you so much again. And so I think uh, we have to 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 stop here because the links should down automatically. It's going to disappear at any moment. <laughs> so it's okay. better than we, that we just uh, say goodbye. And, uh, I'm, I'm pleased if you need something, just you let me know, okay? Okay. Good. Thanks a lot. It's good to meet you after all these years. <laughs> great, great job. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Bye.